Good evening. It's 6 o'clock, December 13, 2011, and this meeting of the Yonville Zoning and Design Review Board is called to order. Tonight, Sandra, will you take a roll call attendance, please? Yes. Um, Member Wunderberg? Here. Member Durham? Here. Member Gates? Here. Me Here. Uh, Member Anglin? <laughs> Chair James? Here. Welcome, Rob. Glad to see you. Is there unanimous consent to adopt the agendas presented? Yes. Seeing yes. no objection, we will so adopt and move on to approval of the minutes from the meeting of November 8th. Corrections or revisions from anyone? Seeing none, I will also ask for unanimous consent to approve those minutes of November 8th as presented to us. Okay. No objection. They are approved. Public comment. Hi. Anybody here tonight who'd like to speak to us about something not on tonight's agenda? Great. Seeing no one, we will skip over the vacant consent agenda and presentation and discussion items and proceed, proceed directly to 8.1, a public hearing for a design review and variance at 1 Fox Club, Sandra, staff report, right? This item is a request for design review and variance for an outdoor fireplace. And there are two variances requested. One is for setback and one is for height. The history behind this project is that the property owner uh, constructed an outdoor fireplace that encroaches into the, the required five foot side yard setback. And the fireplace is located three inches from the side property line. Staff was notified of the fireplace construction from a neighbor. And thereafter, staff notified the applicant of the violation and provided some options to bring the fireplace into conformance with the code and these included removing the fireplace or reconstructing it in a conforming location. Um, the applicant has decided to pursue um, a variance and hopes to leave the fireplace in its existing location. After receiving the application, staff routed the drawings to Cal Fire and the town building inspector. And the building inspector advised staff that the fireplace fails to meet the separation height requirement for the termination of chimneys. And this is due to the close proximity of the neighbor's garage. And the rule is that a chimney must extend two feet above any structure within 10 horizontal feet. And so in order to comply with this requirement, the fireplace would be increased in height by six feet for a total height of 17 feet, six inches, which is approximately a 50% increase in height. And this would exceed the maximum 15 foot height um, requirement for accessory structures. These photos show, um, drawings and photos show the fireplace as constructed um, and located. Um, and this is a photo from the adjacent neighbor's property and you can see it's unfinished on the back side. This photo um, gives you some perspective of what it would be if it were increased in height by six feet. Um, so as you know, variance findings can be very difficult to make. There are some pretty rigorous standards that must be made that there are unique, there's a unique condition that applies to the property that this is not the fault of the applicant and that's not um, an unfair privilege being given to the applicant. Um, and staff has had trouble making these and believes they cannot be met. Um, it's unfortunate that the applicant or his licensed contractor didn't um, contact staff before the work was conducted um, because the situation could have been pre present prevented. Um, and while staff understands a homeowner may not know when a permit is required, um, a licensed contractor is held to a higher standard. Um, and it's not just um, planning department sign off for the height and setback that's required. It's also the building permit that's required for the fireplace construction itself, as well as the electrical gas and water line work. Um, so staff is very empathetic to this applicant for the situation um, that he's in and the funds that have been extended, um, expended to, at this point, but we feel that the findings just simply cannot be made that would support approval of this variance. Thank you, Sandra. Before we ask any questions or hear any further testimony, a disclosure from me, I have met with a concerned neighbor, Michael Andrews. 
He shared some of his concerns with me. I shared with him what I thought some of the applicable rules might be. So I look forward tonight to hearing from the applicant as well as a full airing of all the evidence. Questions of staff? Ooh, while, while you're on that, um, I don't exactly know what the line of my distance from my residence to this location is because we haven't done the map yet. But in case I am within that distance, I don't have any investment in real property, so I do not have to recuse myself, but I do want people to know that I do live relatively close. You're far away. You're far away. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you're far away. I think Mr. Winterberg moved since the last map was done. Yeah. Isn't that right? No? Anyway, questions of staff? before we hear from the public and the applicant. What is the current height that's photographed? That's 11 feet, six inches. Okay. Any other questions of staff? So we'd like to hear from the applicant, Mr. And Mrs. Gunn. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, mind if I move this a little bit? Not at all. All right. All right. And I believe Sandra has uh, my presentation here. Well, first I'd like to introduce myself. Obviously, my name is Mark Gunn. I am the owner of One Fox Glove Lane. Um, I actually live in my primary residence in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was born and raised. Um, I lived there with my wife for 12 years, um, along with my son, who's five years old. Uh, I own restaurants in the Atlanta area called the Melting Pot Restaurants. You might have heard of them. We do have them here in California. I'm a franchisee, though, so I own the ones in Atlanta. My wife is a doctor of pharmacy. And about 17 years ago, I took a, tra a trip out here for our franchise meeting to Napa Valley. It was the first time I'd ever been here. It was my 21st birthday. I came out with my mother, and I was obviously bit by the wine bug at that time uh, with my mom. Went on to further study wine uh, with the restaurant and ended up getting my sommelier. I started traveling out here on a really regular basis every six months, and I was staying at Trefethen Winery and Rombauer. I became really close friends with K.R. Rombauer, and K.R. Rombauer said he really felt that I should buy a place out here because I was kind of overextending my welcome at using his facility. And same thing with Trefethen. The Trefethen house was actually one of the whole reasons I ended up buying a house here because that house was exactly what I wanted. Uh, when I was traveling, I ended up coming into Yachtville. I really felt the home, the homeliness and the small town feel of what Yachtville is all about, the, the great neighbors, the great views, the beauty of, of everything that's all about you know, Yachtville. And in 2006, I uh, purchased uh, my house, if you'll continue to the next slide. This is uh, the house that I purchased in 2006. It's one Fox Glove Lane. <clears throat> Immediately upon purchasing that house, um, I like to be a very proactive person and really maintain what I have. Immediately on, upon purchasing it, I repainted the whole entire outside of the house, removed all the dry rot from the house, repainted the inside, and redid the hardwood floors. Upon doing so, multiple, multiple neighbors noticed what I was doing and also just, uh, came down to ask who painted my house, what kind of color I was using, and they all proceeded to paint their houses as well and upgrade it and you know, upgrade the community. And really, I felt like I you know, set the standard to what Yachtville is all about and what people want Yachtville to be. And I like to maintain it. And so therefore, um, I continue to all the time try to uh, invest into my property and make it make it more. As we all know in this down economy, I'm upside down on that house, so I'm doing everything that I can and may one day never be able to make my money back out of it. I'm trying to invest into the property, one, to increase the value, stabilize it, as well as, uh, as, well as increase the values of the homes around me. So in doing so, um, you know, I, I contacted um, a, uh, a designer for landscape designer and I wanted to do something in my backyard. She came and presented uh, all kinds of, um, of options, and the one option that we absolutely loved and agreed upon for the landscape was the addition of the fireplace. 
Um, the fireplace, uh, you know, is something that's, that we've, I've always wanted. It's something, a dream of mine to always have had an outdoor fireplace. So when we decided to go and build it, we went through multiple different, if you could go to the next slide, please. Multiple different pictures. These are some of the options that we looked at. The one on the top, a matter of fact, is the exact rendition of what we built. So that was what I came to choose. As you can see, they're all integrated into landscape. And if you look good to the next slide. This is what was originally there, was um, a water feature which actually touched the, um, the, I guess, the setback. It actually was up against uh, the fence, as well as you can see the potato vines that are growing there. Those potato vines uh, caused a really big rat problem that we have. Um, I've always treated for them, but one of the uh, concerns that was presented by Clark Pest Control is, and the, their recommendation was to remove those vines and remove the water feature because it was the harboring for the rats, and they felt that it would decrease the amount of rats that we had. Um, and matter of fact, to this day, I have not seen a rat. We literally could sit under our arbor at night and have rats drop on your head. And I'm not kidding, it was not fun. Um, so in doing so, we wanted to clean it up and really, you know, again, increase the value of my home. So we built the fireplace. We built the fireplace, um, if you want to go on to the next slide. As you can see here, this is, this is it somewhat finished. I mean, it's finished, but there is additional work that needs to be done on it as soon as we got the letter that, you know, it was, we weren't going over the proper routes of doing it, I immediately uh, contacted my landscape contractor and stopped construction. Um, as you can see though, uh, according to the picture, it's not attached to my house. The wall of the fireplace actually extends all the way down my property line and forms, um, and forms the planters to where the vines are growing. So it's an intricate part of the landscape uh, on top of that, the, the walls on either side, vines will be growing on that and flowering vines that will kind of sit on top. And on the back side of the fireplace itself, vines will be growing up. So it's going to be used as a trellis system. Um, and uh, so you can go to the, the next slide. So this is just the different angle that's shot back. You can see how the wall forms all the way down to form the actual planters where the vines, actually those are uh, kiwi growing in. This slide, here you can go, that's fine, is actually a shot from my neighbor's uh, side of the fence. This is two days ago. The, um, you can see that the leaves are three quarters of the way off of this tree. It's barely visible. It is, <clears throat> it is not blocking any vista. There's no mountain or ocean. It's used to where he parks his uh, trash cans. Obviously, the trash, you know, the rest of the trash is out on the street for that day. If you flip to the next slide, this is a shot from the street. My house is to the left, and this is his garage. You cannot see the fireplace, um, even if uh, it was deemed that we have to uh, raise, raise it to the 17.6 or add additional six feet onto it. Um, so going back, though, to the landscape, I contacted uh, Tara Burns, which is here today with me, to uh, decide what we should do again with the backyard. She is a fully licensed landscape uh, designer and designed this into the landscape. When I went to build it, I asked, who do I approach about building this? Do you have anybody that you recommend? She recommended uh, a, a numerous amount of landscape contractors. The uh, landscape contractor that she recommended was Martinez Landscaping, uh, which is here as well today. Um, and then as soon as I got the letter, um, obviously, you know, I was concerned. I did not mean to do any wrong. Uh, in Georgia, uh, we have, um, I live in a, a community where we, when you, association, and when I originally bought this home, you know, I found out that we don't have association, so I didn't feel that I had to go get any kind of approvals. I understand in Georgia, you know, we have to get an approval because I have an association, but due to the fact that I didn't have an association here, I didn't know that I had to get any kind of approval to build uh, a landscape uh, on the back of my property. So in choosing, 
in choosing all the people involved, you know, I went back and I also hired a California licensed engineer to do form drawings, which are here today. And there's two sets of those um, showing the distances. The distance as we measure it um, is a little over eight and a half inches, not three. Um, a little bit, a little bit greater than than it was. But again, the fire or the water feature there was uh, touching the actual, uh, touching the actual, uh, uh, you know, uh, side of the wall, as well as the uh, variances uh, throughout all of Yountville that are supposed to be three feet for um, uh, three feet for the garages and five feet for a house. The ha his garage actually measures two foot six from my house, so it's actually encroaching again on my side. So technically, it's six inches, which I'd be 14 inches away uh, with that aspect of it. Uh, so going through the town, I noticed that a lot of the structures are not built to the three foot standard that is set. There's plenty of garages that are less than two feet away and that you could barely walk through to get in between those structures. So there was just a few other things that I noticed. Um, going over the codes, when I go to read the code, um, uh, for what uh, was presented on, uh, on their, their case, for accessory structure, the code reads as follows. An accessory structure shall be limited to garages, carports, patio covers, swimming pools, hot tubs, spas, related equipment, decks over 30 inches above ground, workshops, storage sheds, gazebos, and greenhouses. And every single one of those have one thing in common, is they all have a roof. My fireplace does not have a roof. It is not a pool. It is not a spa. It is not a hot tub. So it does not fall under that classification as an accessory structure. Landscape element from the code. Landscape element means structural elements, such as patios, trellises, planters, attached decks under 30 inches in height, and that are part of the outdoor landscape and forms upon which landscape is intended to grow. My fireplace is an intricate part of the landscape. It forms the planters and uh, within the backyard, as well as it is a trellis for the growing of the vines and the rest of the greenery that is hopefully going to be grown on either side in the back of the fireplace. Um, let's see. The, also, the code is not explicit as to whether an outdoor fireplace is an accessory building that is subject to setback and height, height requirements. So whether is it a landscape element is not. So a landscape element is not, does not have to have a variance and is not part of the setback or height requirements. So from everybody involved in this project professionally and myself, uh, my family, the way we read and understand this is it is a landscape element and not an accessory structure in every aspect. Uh, so therefore I, Kindly ask, you can actually keep going down. We'll kind of go through some, some other photos here. This is just, this is part of the construction. Uh, we took all kinds of photos when we were doing it because I just wanted to make sure that it was built right, that it was built soundly, uh, that it was safe, which it completely is. Go to the next, uh, please. Um, this is just going back. I want to reiterate, oh, if you go back one more slide. Reiterating um, why it's a landscape element. The building code does not state that it is an accessory building. Uh, the building code defines a building as any structure used or intended for supporting or sheltering <clears throat> any use or occupancy in Section 202, and that's the California uh, building code. Um, and then also your code uh, for Yachtville in specific, as I read before. The, the same building code that has a very narrow set of exceptions for work that doesn't require a building permit. I'm sorry? The same building code, when you reference the California building code, the same building code that has a, only a very narrow set of exceptions for work that doesn't require a building permit. But, but we're talking about the variance, not a building permit, correct? Um, it does come into play. Yes, I understand that. So, okay. Um, and then 
Of course, um, you know, again, it's, it's strictly a beautiful, uh, beautifying feature to the landscape. Um, and again, that's why it would be designed and built by everybody that's in the landscape industry. Um, it's occupationally, you can live in, you can't live in it, but uh, unlike the other structures that, that are shown in, uh, for accessory structures, and the only benefit of it is, is a radiant heat, heat source. Um, so we also, for safety or, you know, for gas accessory, it's a gas fireplace. It is not a wood-burning fireplace. Um, it's a decorative appliance and uh, obviously illustrated in the drawings. Um, and again, it's an in intricate part of the planter, and as a matter of fact, it forms a planter, which I went and said before. So if you could go to the next slide. Again, just uh, reiterating, I want to reiterate again that it was designed by a landscape designer and built by a landscape contractor. If you could flip to the next one. This is just what I said earlier. <clears throat> um, it is not visible from the street. Um, and all the pictures that we showed, it's not visible from any neighbor's house. No vistas uh, that are blocked uh, by the fireplace at any height, regardless of, of what height it is. Uh, if you could go to the next one. Just another side picture looking down back through how you can see how it extends. This is the actual planters that it forms. There's the side of the fireplace that <clears throat> really holds the planter together. Again, just the, another shot. So <clears throat> finally, you know, I know that your time is precious. My time is precious. I flew all the way out here from Georgia. This means a lot to me and my family. We work very hard to build this fireplace and make it our home and again hopefully you be able to use and again stabilize in this falling economy uh, you know the home prices and we would love to use it before I continue I'd like to ask that you consider this is of what it is a landscape element and not a structural uh, or excuse me not a um, a uh, accessory structure and I'm asking you that you vote now on whether it is a landscape element or an accessory structure before I continue. If I continue, I can go and answer all of the variance requests that you asked me to answer as well. I can tell you we won't be taking any votes until we've heard from anybody else who wants to talk sure, yeah, amongst, no, but, amongst ourselves, sure. but I can tell you we'll give you an opportunity to come back come and back. speak. Okay. after the rest of the public has spoken and we may have had some questions for you. So anyone with specific questions for the applicant at this time? I do. Yes. Um, is is um, Martinez Landscaping a licensed architect or what? a licensed uh, contractor? Li licensed landscaped and licensed to build fireplaces, yes. Okay. In the state of California, yes. He's here. And he's here if you need okay. to speak with him as well. Well, I do have a question. I th this happens a lot and I think... Um, Professionals have a responsibility to um, um, follow the, the rules in terms of submitting for a building permit. I think if this had been submitted as a building permit, uh, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in today. So I'm, I'm asking the question, why wasn't a building permit uh, requested? If you've built a lot of these fireplaces, which I'm sure you have, and now I'm speaking to... Um, Mr. Martinez. Yes, Mr. Martinez. Um, why didn't you pursue um, a building permit as the first step in this? So, we please come to the mic to answer, sir, so we can capture your voice and image. Thank you. And if you'll introduce yourself also, please. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Martinez. Uh, it was replacing the uh, uh, existing structure of the uh, water feature. Okay. Um, so you did that, but then um, you were asked to build this fireplace. Did you have a discussion with the owner about whether you should pursue a building permit to do this work? Well, there was a, a, a brief discussion of that. And, and, what, and who, who decided not to, to submit for a permit? Uh, well, we thought that because it was just replacing an existing structure. Uh, well, it was a, replacing a, a pond. Yeah, it was it's like that, that picture doesn't. Doesn't but I mean, it's it. a fireplace replacing a pond. It's so it's it's a new construction. And, it's and, not and replacing. I, I, and I, again, I, that's not my. I'm not a. That's not my profession. So I. No, I, I understand. But I'm just. For, I'm just 
yeah, saying no, it would seem logical that you're replacing something that's totally different from what you're going to build, and so I would think that you would pursue getting a, a building permit. So there must have been a discussion about that, and who decided not to submit for a building permit? Well, I, I, I mean, there wasn't, again, there was no discussion or, or you know, whether we needed a permit. It was, again, we both felt that it was replacing an existing structure, so I don't, there wasn't, like, really a, a conversation of, like, hey, we need to go get a permit or ask to get a permit that, that just that, that didn't come up in a conversation. So I don't, I don't know mm. how to answer that, but okay. It, I mean, that, that that is what it is. But I, that, I don't understand how to answer the question without. Well, I mean, it's pretty and, basic. And I, and I understand that it, it it needs it. And and again, that I take full blame and responsibility. And we are here today to correct that. And I'm that's why I hired an engineer. And that's why I've spent lots of extra money that. Was needed. I trust me. I don't. I didn't want to have to. I don't want to have to spend any more money than I already have. We're in the uppers of thirty-five thousand dollars, and you have receipts in front of you from what we've paid, not including, you know, what I've paid to get these gentle, some of these gentlemen here. Because the gentleman for that, uh, I flew all the way out from Florida, and I had to pay for him to fly out from Florida. That's, you know, was able to draw the plans. So I understand. I think that the 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 basic problem here was a permit wasn't applied for. Yeah, and I and I know that for future. And trust me, anything that that I, I'm going to do on my property will 110 percent go through, you know, Sandra or whoever it is that I need to contact because I, I don't want to be in this position. I don't like standing behind this podium. As a bit and, of friendly advice, I'll tell you that the state of Georgia and the state of California mm -hmm. use the same model code. Every local jurisdiction in California or Georgia sure. uses the International Building Code as a model, so we don't have two sets of rules. Yeah, I understand. I wouldn't know the first thing about how to operate a restaurant. It'd yeah, it'd be a disaster. But bear that in mind. We don't. It's, the problem here is because there are two sets of rules: one in Georgia and one in California. No, it's and no, and I, 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 I'm not, and I'm not trying to say that there's two separate rules by any stretch of imagination. All I'm trying to say is that I know that in Georgia, I just, I have, in, in my community, that you know, we ask permission from the uh, um, our, our homeowners, yeah, homeowners association not a, a sure. city council or anything like if I when I go to like paint my house I have to ask you know what color I'm going to paint my house and when I remember specifically when we bought the house that was one of the things they said you know you don't have a homeowners association here so I didn't know that I needed to go get approval to do anything it's you know it's a small well you know I, I think We'll have this discussion later because I do think another um, point of, of discussion that we need to have is for people who are second homeowners like yourself, mm -hmm. live out of state, aren't familiar with things here, um, and, and we've, we've had, you're not the first one that we've run into that's been a, a, a second home owner that has done something that, that didn't, didn't uh, look for a permit and got in trouble doing that. And, and there needs to be some kind of a disclosure to new buyers in our town, and this is specific to our town, that it's like the ag preserve, that when you buy in the ag preserve, you sign a document that says you understand that, that it's, it's an ag preserve, there are farming and, and associated things with that, and uh, it, 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 it short uh, cuts a lot of problems in the future that they've had in the past. I think the same thing exists with out-of-state, out-of-second homeowners who buy into the town and don't know the rules and hire a local um, professional to do work. And that professional, whether there's a discussion or not about a there should be every time a, pro a professional should ask that, but there's, that doesn't happen. And then you end up like you are today. Yeah. And, and, and it's I very think that we need to do something like that and talk about it in a separate time about what we can do to create a document that is, is part of a sales agreement. I don't know if that's that's within our realm of doing it, but I think that there are more than one person like yourself that has, has gotten into trouble because they didn't seek a building permit, and that's the fundamental problem tonight. I have, Mr. Gunn, a specific question for you. You said earlier that this is a gas Fired appliance. It's a gas-burning fireplace only. Yes, gas. What makes it impossible for wood to be burned in it? 
Um, well, we, she, Sandra asked that question. I, mean, I, I, guess, I, I didn't build it, so I don't want to answer you know engineering question that that. Uh, can anyone, do you want to answer What that? renders it such that this fireplace can't be used for wood burning combustion? And this is, a, I think, a key point, particularly when we discuss the height. Good afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when I went through the um, plan. Sir, would you please introduce yeah, yourself? Yeah, my name is Henry Pio. How do you do? I'm a registered professional engineers, uh, engineer in California. Actually, I said engineers because I'm a registered professional mechanical engineer and a registered professional civil engineer in the state of California. Uh, when I had my communication with Ms. Sandra Smith, and I think she was contacting the fire marshal at that time, one of the things that I was directed to, uh, to do that I have to include in my plans a statement saying, or the design of the plan should include only gas, and uh, I, I got a comment back that I only said it's gas. I didn't say wood cannot be burnt in this. So, and sir, I did revise the plans accordingly. My question isn't do the plans say don't use wood? Is there something about the fireplace itself? For example, I have a wood burning fireplace and a gas fired fireplace in my personal residence. The gas fired fireplace is sealed combustion. It's impossible to access the combustion chamber and load it with wood. I, in my prior residence, had a fireplace that had gas or wood capability. So my question here is not how are you specifying on the plans don't use wood. What is it about this construction that will make it impossible to use firewood in the fireplace? Well, and again, the question for context relates to the height of the discharge as it relates to adjacent structures. Right. Okay, of course, there's nothing impossible, but if you're using this kind of uh, wood in this kind of fireplace, you're going to block the combustion, the, the flame artifice, you're going to ruin it. This, uh, and the, the way it's designed, the reason it went to that height, because it's classified as a, as a gas uh, decorative appliance, which is a very safe, and we were planning, we, we're open to modification. I mean, if we went, we, after we go through this, we're going to go pro, through permitting, we are willing to do whatever it takes to make this meat coats, but uh, it has the door and it meets the mechanical code as a gas decorative appliance and the gas decorative appliance requires a type of vent that is type B vent that follows the 10 foot, 2 foot rule. And if it follows the 10 foot, 2 foot rule, we have to go to that height. And actually we decided, actually Mark decided, after we looked at many models, we're not going to just, we're not planning just to, uh, to get the masonry structure six foot more. We're going to do a metal in the middle, and it's going uh, to be much more nicer than that, not just a big bulky structure is going to go six foot more. Uh, am I understanding correctly that regardless, you need to extend the discharge six feet? Well, there are other alternatives. If we go to this option and we continue with the building department with this option, yes, we have to go with that height to meet the 10 foot because that was also a comment from the inspector that conveyed to us through Ms. Smith. But I'm really wrestling with this because if it's only discharging burned gas, You've got a different standard, so I'm having a hard time understanding why you would go to 17 feet in height if it's not a wood burning structure. And I'm again really trying to home in on it, and I do want you to answer, Mr. Gunn. What's going to render this masonry fireplace unsuitable for the use of wood? So, oh, okay, I understand that. Well, well first of all, we had, because if we had to stop everything in the middle of the process. We haven't gotten to that point to get anything else answered from the building department. Um, so trust me, I don't want to have to build it to 17.6 either. I would much rather keep it for where it's at. Um, whatever they tell us to do to deem it that it'll just burn gas, we'll do. Okay. That, we, we'll, we'll do that. We, we were going to add uh, a sign, a placard sign that cannot be removed that says, on the fireplace that this is a gas use fireplace only as well as we were going to add the accessory door 
for instance, that you talked about to enclose it. Uh, that was, that's one of the things on the, on the revised plans, and I don't know if you received those revised, revised plans. Okay, thank you. I think and, that- and We were directed to do so, excuse me. We were directed to do the, the, this, and that's why we did it. I have, the I have some more questions for the applicant. Uh, for Mr. P.O. Yes. Please do. Go ahead. Um, um, if it's a gas fireplace, can you have a vent, uh, ventless uh, gas fireplace? We because can. I've, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead and answer. Uh, yes, we can. We have other alternatives. Okay, which don't include a stack. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. We could do that. Okay. There are other alternatives for uh, approved. Okay. Methods. And the other thing I want, because I want to be clear on this, uh, the, the, the steps in the process, the interior designer um, talked to Mr. Gunn and came up with this idea, went through the process of deciding what the fireplace was going to look like. Then you, the uh, interior or the landscape designer, contacted Martinez Landscaping to build this fireplace. Is that correct? Yes. And then um, the neighbor um, uh, notified the town that this was being built. And then Mr. Pio got involved in the process. Yes. Is that correct? To okay. prepare the plans okay. and that, uh, comply with the code. Okay. Well, let me, let, me t let me say this. That fireplace is built as a wood-burning fireplace with a gas log starter. That's a wood-burning fireplace. The construction is 100% wood-burning fireplace. It's not a gas fireplace. You're, gonna, you're proposing to retrofit this gas, this fireplace, to a gas fireplace, but as it stands right now, it's a uh, wood-burning fireplace. So what we need to do is by, ex essentially you're asking to uh, extend the, the chimney so you can meet the code, um, and it is class B, so it would have to be 10 feet and two feet, but it's for a wood-burning fireplace. And as you just said, there are other venting op options, options yes. that don't require the same height that you're talking about. Yes. Correct. I including, if we go back to the wood, there is an approved product, actually, it, uh, we, we have it here in this presentation. We were going to just touch on other alternatives. It's, an, it's a company that's in Santa Rosa, FMI, that they manufactured a package uh, re retrofit that fits in this stone fireplace that requires only four feet high vent. Measured from? From the bottom of the burning chamber. Any other questions of the applicant at this juncture? So, Mr. Gunn, I think you'll be back. Okay. Now what I'd like to do is invite any interested members of the public to speak. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And again, I just uh, hope that you see it from our our point and our perspective that. Um, well, ag again, I've asked uh, if anybody else would like an opportunity okay, to sorry. speak. You will be okay, given a, sure. a chance to sure. finish up as the applicant. Sure. Is there anybody here tonight else from the public who'd like to speak? Please come on up. Good evening, my name is Michael Andrews. I am the owner of 3 Foxglove Lane. My only comment this evening is I feel approval of this variance would set a bad precedent in the town. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here who'd like to speak? Oh, hello. Hi, my name is uh, William Segee. I've lived in Yonville for about uh, four and a half years. I live on 6816, it's on the corner of Yacht and Yachtville Crossroad. Betty, the old can lady, apparently used to live there. And I'm sure you've probably <laughs> dealt with my landlord, and, or you should have if you haven't. Um, just speaking on behalf of Mr. Gunn, uh, he is an asset to Yonville. He is a supporter of Napa Valley um, and the wineries. And as a businessman and as a fellow resident of Yonville, I can assure you he's not like a lot of people that come to this valley that throw down a credit card or will just steamroll whatever they want to do ag, preserve, be damned, whatever it is, and they'll just pay the fine later. As soon as he was uh, notified that there was something wrong with this, he did stop. He's presenting it to you today. He's a fair and reasonable man, and I hope that you give him the opportunity to rectify the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Zoe Harris, and I leave, live in Two Pals Club Lane across to Mark. And um, I have nothing against. It's great that, um, first of all, I lived there for 14 years. I have two children, and so this is our residence. And where we live is really before uh, Mark came. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, neighborhood. You know, people always, you know, they keep up this neighborhood. So it's not just because you came, you know, we keep up, no. But before that, it's been, it's been a wonderful neighborhood. But I have nothing against with all this thing. What I'm just going to say is, if this fireplace is not up the code, so I'm sure you guys will do the right thing, you know, because like I said, we live here. My children grew up here, and I mean, they're still growing, and we're here all the time. So if something happened, if there's a fire because of that, it'll be on your hand. <laughs> so if, if it's, you know, if it's right, you know what I mean, Jeff. <laughs> but thank you. Anyone else from the public who cares to comment on this issue? Okay. I do. Any, before we ask the applicant to have, come up and make his final comments, any follow up questions to staff? I have one question to staff before we hear from Mr. Gunn again in deliberations. What is the height, rather, what are the heights of the demising fence? That is the solid portion and the lattice portion, respectively. I believe it's probably <clears throat> five and a half or six foot plus an extension, but we don't know for sure. What's your best guess? Five and a half plus two. Six and two. Six, six and two. Okay. And I understand that's an estimate based on a photograph. So, please, Sandra. The just so I get my head around, the, the issue is not the planner. The issue is the fireplace. Correct. The planner's fine. It is, yes. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Gunn, do you have any final words you'd like to say after you speak? We're going to we'll close the public hearing. We'll deliberate and vote. So this is kind of your, your shot. I actually want to uh, go specifically down the staff report and answer everything that uh, Sandra has put within the staff report. So if you have, if you don't have that, I, I have the staff report. If you Thank you, we do. Okay. You're going to attempt to make the fi variance findings, I believe, starting in the latter Correct. So I think you need two. me to answer all six of what would uh, uh, be in compliance for uh, a variance. Um, so uh, for the staff report, it said it will, um, while the fireplace constru uh, construction is very attractive, at a height of 17.6, it is quite tall, both taller than permitted for accessory structures for the first four uh, plate height of a primary structure. In addition, given the location, three inches uh, from the property line could be considered unsightly or create uh, disharmony with the surroundings. Uh, my response to that is, it is an integral part, uh, integral part of the landscape surroundings, uh, and it is not referred to as an accessory structure, again, in the California Codes and Zoning Ordinance or listed in the Yachtville uh, Code Ordinance. It's not defined clearly. Um, in our experience of for certain, uh, let's see, sorry. Um, uh, and then even, even before uh, with this project, we felt that the whole part of this was a landscape design. And when you asked the question earlier about the planter, the fireplace is the planter. That is that is the whole fireplace. It's not a separate unit. It is all attached to one unit, which forms that planter, <clears throat> which we go back to, again, reiterate that that is a landscape element and one whole piece, shape, and form. Um, it's just an additional, uh, you know, piece of beauty that's added to what makes the landscape. So for so that's our response to for the first question for the staff report and number two. Um, 
it will not appear or interfere with the development use or enjoyment of other property in the vicinity nor the uh, nor will the orderly or pleasing development of the neighborhood as a whole, including the public lands and rights of way. Sandra wrote, while the, while the fireplace does not rise to the level of interfering with orderly and, and pleasing development on the neighbor as a whole, it does impact the adjacent neighbor's development, use, or enjoyment of the property given the height of the tall fireplace and its conjunction uh, as the shared property line. Um, we... Uh, as a matter of fact, for the setbacks, as a landscape element does not uh, apply to a setback or height requirement. Um, it is simply, again, part of the overall landscape and forming of the planters and the trellis system that is in the backyard. Additionally, the fireplace is not blocking any significant vista. That was clearly shown in the pictures. With or without the fireplace, the neighbor's uh, view or property is is not affected. Uh, he clearly has his trash cans there. I don't think he's sitting there on a daily basis viewing over to look at trash cans or my house, which is technically the vista. Um, and we are planning again, you know, in the overall design of it to add the flowers to it again, which makes it the intricate part of the landscape. For number two, um, the, it will not directly or in a uh, cumulative fashion impair, inhibit, or limit further investment or improvements in the vicinity, in the vicinity or in the same or other properties. Um, she said the fireplace should not impair, inhibit, or limit further investment or improvements in the vicinity given the small scale of the backyard and the location of the improvement. We completely agree with that. Um, Number four, it will minimize or eliminate adverse physical or visual effects uh, which might have otherwise from unplanned or inappropriate development design and Judas position. Such adverse effects may include but are not limited to those products by the design, location, and characteristics of the following, uh, area paths, right-of-ways, uh, so on, and other developments or improvements may result in the demolition, or, I'm sorry, dominion of elimination of the sun and light exposure. Uh, views or vistas. While the fireplace does not generally result in adverse impacts, it may result in the dominion of the adjacent views or vistas. <clears throat> Our response to that is, as we mentioned above, the neighbor's vista uh, has been is of our property, uh, specifically the backyard. Additionally, uh, there would be no uh, no difference in height or view, whether it was three inches away, eight inches or five feet, the height would still be the same. Um, the difference in the setback uh, being close to the house outside the planning area adjacent to the fence uh, even at 15 feet. <clears throat> For number five, it will, uh, it will satisfy the standards and uh, resolutions to the town council that may adopt the regarding design approval of these standards. Um, the variance for the height and setback uh, exemptions are approved. The fireplace will meet the town standards. It already meets your standards in, in that aspect. The fireplace, um, uh, obviously we didn't rip down any trees. Going down to the criteria for the variance approval, uh, number one in the staff report uh, was answered, there are no exception or extraordinary circumstances applied to this property, although the fact that there was a waterfall stone fountain previously constructed in the exact location as a fireplace and the fact that the garages throughout the Washington Park neighborhood are constructed three feet from the property line could leave and did lead uh, me to believe that there was no setbacks or any permitted needed. Um, my response to that is, you know, we believe that the fireplace is a landscape element which is exempt from setback requirements. Uh, the neighbor's garage, again, is two foot six away where it should be three feet away. Um, as outlined in the staff report, and uh, that that is a setback issue on its own. The location of the fireplace in lieu of the waterfall was not an expansion of the used space in the backyard, which had the benefit of eliminating the rodent problem as well. So number two, Sandra's response was um, particularly difficult, or difficulty and under unnecessary hardship do not exist because the applicant uh, could have constructed the fireplace in uh, conformance with the town code and any any money spent in, uh, to remedy the violation 
is attributed to the applicant's uh, action in constructing the fireplace without town approval. I've spent over $30,000 on building this fireplace. Um, so that definitely creates a hardship. Had I not built this fireplace, and I was here today to ask for this variance, by not giving me the variance is also not helping me maintain and stabilize the falling uh, uh, home prices in, this, in California and in the neighborhood. Again, I'm upside down on the house, so adding this is definitely adding value to the house and the overall community and hopefully increasing the home value or at least stabilizing it. So that also creates a hardship by not allowing me to have it. Uh, number three, uh, uh, the grant of the variance would be a grant of special privilege because similar situated properties must conform to the town's height and setback requirements. To the best of our knowledge, this is a unique situation uh, which does not exist on the record of the city of Yountville. And additionally, we don't see any reason for not allowing landscape features and other properties similar to the fireplace as it adds to the enjoyment of the property and improves the value of the home as well as, again, as a landscape element and part of the landscape. Um, number four, uh, the variance is not necessary for the uh, preservation and enjoyment of the applicant's property right because the fireplace cannot have been constructed in conformance with the town code. The variance is necessary for the enjoyment of the property for the following reasons. The, f the, the fireplace was part of our dream and vision when, when we decided to purchase a property and we consider the backyard a useful and functional part of our property. Again, it will increase uh, the value of the house in such an economic downturn uh, and hopefully swing me from the downside to the upside. Uh, we're, the, we're a close-knit family, um, not just with myself, uh, my father-in-law who also flew from Florida to support me. Uh, my father would have been here, but uh, he's a little bit ill at the moment. And my wife had to unfortunately stay at home with my son but also from the local town. I have a lot of friends here that support everything that I do for the community and the welfare of the community. Um, uh, the fireplace will maximize the use of my backyard uh, and really make it more efficient than what it was. Uh, number five, uh, the variance will not uh, be detrimental to the public welfare, and if the chimney height is increased to 17.6, it will not pose a fire hazard, but the appearance of the tall chimney may be in, uh, injurious to the adjacent neighbor. There's no ev evidence that the height of the chimney is injurious to the, neighbors, and to the neighbor, even if it's, we have to increase it to 17.6. I am here to say, again, we, we don't, I don't want to spend any more money. If I have to modify it to, a little bit to make sure that it's gas only and approve that it's gas only and we can leave it at the current height, I'm completely fine with. But if the building code requires me to build it to 17.6, again, it, it's, there's no evidence to support that it's blocking any view or vista. Um, and the appearance of the natural stone will you know, contribute to the overall um, you know, improvement of, of the house in the neighborhood. Six, uh, uh, the granting of the variance is not consistent with the town's height and setback requirements for accessory structures is her reply. Um, this is not an accessory structure, clearly, but rather the landscape element, which should not have a negative impact on the general purpose and intent of, of any ordinance. Uh, this element does not include or um, is not occupiable, uh, and it is not a building and is not explicit, explicitly listed as an accessory building or a uh, structure in your code. That's all I have. And Thanks very much. You're welcome. So I'm going to close the public hearing. We will deliberate and then entertain motions. Motion or motions. Would anyone care to begin with trying to craft us towards a resolution? I'll let somebody else start. I will, if no one else wishes to. Um, one, I'm, I want to touch on just a couple of things you, you hit on, and I know you can't come up to respond. The hardship has to do with if you were unable to do new work, not the hardship that might entail, which could be very, not could be, would be very real if you had to go backward in time. As real as that hardship might be to you, what the code contemplates is a hardship of someone, say, being unable to build a garage on their property because they only have a 10-foot space available to do so. I want to 
moreover touch on a little bit of the height limit as we come to that. The accessory structure contemplates a height limit of 10 feet to plate line, 15 feet overall. To me, that's always contemplating whether it's a gabled roof or a shed roof. It's not the entire structure might be, say, 15 feet tall. Um, with that said, we can run through a lot of these. My view kind of is as follows, that Mr. Gunn has correctly identified the fundamental question, is this a landscape element or a structure? I will be unable to support any ruling that doesn't render this a structure. This is a structure. It requires a building permit. If it were a landscape element, it would solely be a medium for the growing of vines or perhaps casting of shade. Um, I will tell you, you have my great, great sympathy. To the extent you relied upon professionals licensed to do business in the state of California, we have a licensed architect here. I'm a licensed contractor. I'm astonished that any such professional would not tell you in writing repeatedly you must get a permit for this before it was done. So you have a lot of my sympathy that that may have been done to you. I don't know the facts of the case, but I'm astonished that anybody with a license would do be part of this without a permit with gas and electrical and foundations and wood combustion. Nevertheless, we can't act on that. We can only act on the application in front of us. Everything from my view follows from if it's a structure, there's a height limit, there's a setback requirement, and we have a life safety issue about discharging wood burning embers. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm leading. I, I think we may have some serial options for some serial motions that we might be able to craft a compromise. Um, but first, I think we should discuss the fundamental issue of whether this is a structure. I think everything, every other decision we could take flows from that. Well, I'll comment on that since I'm the one always complaining about walls or the structures or not. Um, I, I agree. I don't think there's any other way we can view this other than being a structure. Yes, there's a planner attached, but I believe it's a fireplace with a planner attached, not a planner with a fireplace attached. Uh, this is clearly the primary focus and the massing of the structure as well. So I'd support that I would consider it a structure as well. So I have another take on it, and um, Sandra, so if, if someone built a wall on a side yard, how high could they build the wall? Walls are limited to six feet in height, and there's the exception for a two-foot lattice extension. Okay. And the wall and can be built out of anything, And that's only permitted on side right? or rear property lines. That's, right. what, that's that? only permitted on side and rear property lines. Okay. And the wall can be built out of anything. It doesn't have to be built out of wood. It can be built out of stone. Correct. So I, I could see, I mean, obviously this was built as a wood-burning fireplace, but I could see that if it came up to six feet, that it could be considered a landscape element like a wall at the property line. And so if you can take a wall to the zero lot clearance, then you can build a structure that's under six feet tall that could be construed as a landscape element. So I would be willing to propose that if the top, it looks like the top of the firebox is at six feet, which is the height of the wall that's adjacent to. So if the, the, the superstructure above that six feet were taken down and there was no extension for um, a chimney, then I could see this as a, a gas burning landscape element. I could see that. But you would have to show me, and this is why, Mr. Pio, I was asking you about um, um, ventless fireplaces. If you could get a vent that didn't exceed the six feet and you had a totally sealed combustion fireplace in there, which will be a challenge because those things are UL, rest, uh, UL rated. And so you're going to have to do some, some modifications to the firebox to get a UL rated uh, assembly in there. Then I would say that you would have a landscape element as long as it wasn't above that. Now, the rest of the committee may not agree with me on that, but um, that's sort of my take on it. That's great. Anyone else care to comment on the issue of 
whether it's a structure, Mr. Anglin's proposing a, a, a potential compromise. You're free to introduce new ideas or? I'm in favor of perhaps compromising myself, but that's okay. a, something worth discussing. Okay. Mr. Durham? I don't mind a compromise. I just want to be clear that this is an accessory building, an accessory structure, and not a landscape element. It's, it is a fireplace with a planner attached to it, period. All right. So, Mr. Winterberg, your turn. Before, then I mean, I was start crafting some motions. I was thinking the same thing that uh, uh, Member Anglin was thinking. Just looking at it, then it wouldn't impact the neighbor. It wouldn't be towering over um, the fence. Uh, again, I guess kind of like our struggles with signage, I'd want to be very careful about how we craft this. I don't want us to consider any fireplace is now not an accessory structure. I believe it still is. And so if we do a compromise, that we still need to keep that language. So the neighbor doesn't want to throw in a fireplace and say, no, it's actually a wall. But isn't that the issue we had with Bartisono too? In that, that's that wall out front that now has a sign on it is a architectural element or a landscape element. It's an issue that turns on the definition as this issue before you could be considered. All right. Okay. So I think what we're going to need to do is handle this in several. The sense where I think the board is heading, I think. To fulfill that sense, we need to handle this in several different actions. So the instant question is, shall we grant a variance for the project as constructed? Is there a motion to make the required findings and grant the variances for height and setback? You know, I, I don't think that the, the applicant has met the standard for, of hardship for a variance. I, I'm going to move the question. Oh, sorry. Is my it's not debatable the question is there a motion to make the findings and grant the variance nope see no motion so there is no action to approve so that we're very clear i'm now going to rephrase the question is there a motion to not make the findings and to deny the request for a variance staff is encouraged us to always take an affirmative vote when there's not a motion we need to craft a motion that we can vote on you mean to to deny the variance request yes so so now the second action we're going to entertain is there a motion to not make the findings and deny the variance request i'll make the motion is there a second i'll second it all in favor aye aye, aye. opposed so now i think we have an opportunity <clears throat> or third action if you will is to craft a motion that may incorporate a compromise that there seemed to, for lack of a better word, a compromise that there seemed to be some support for. Um, the sense I was getting was a structure not taller than six feet, a structure that was, I'll insert some language here, proved to the satisfaction of the planning and building director to solely be able to be used for gas fired equipment not convertible, not a sign that just says don't burn gas. Um, and in that case, the board, again, this is just conceptually, be willing to approve the reduction in setback. At that point, consider it perhaps a zero lot line. That is the sense of what I got. I would add in that you, one might consider given the assumed height of the adjacent fence and our standard side and year yard fencing substantially constructed to say six feet with accoutrement from six to eight feet. Might craft that so that it's not taller than the adjacent fence. If the adjacent fence is five and a half feet solid and a total of seven and a quarter feet then with the vented. So that's my own insertion. Um, yeah, I, I would just um, say that the code does allow a six foot fence. So if it's five and a half feet at the property line and this is six feet, then I would think that would be okay. But what I, I would want to make sure that whatever kind of venting system that this fireplace comes up with does not exceed that six feet. 
So in other words, six feet is what we allow for walls on, on uh, side yards. And so this whole structure needs to be within that allowed six feet. So however you decide to vent it that, that meets the standards of uh, the building department, I would go along with that. And I would also, I, I don't think that you can put a gas fireplace in there that's not UL listed. So I would um, require that that's UL listed um, as part of that. Will you uh, care to craft the motion, Mr. Anglin? Um, why don't you do it? I think you've got all the... Um, I will. It'll, it'll be a little different, but it won't be different what you say. That's, that's so, what I want. So, um, move to approve the fireplace limited to a total height. And it, we move to approve the fireplace in its current construction with the following limitations. The total height must not exceed six feet above grade. To the satisfaction of the planning and building official, it must be altered such that it includes a UL listed, solely gas fired, sealed combustion chamber appliance. I think that's it. We don't necessarily care which way it vents, no, whether no. it's ventless, as long as it provides that and it goes without saying a building permit will be issued and will allow the appropriate fire and building authorities to determine where it is safe and legal to vent right. the gas. Very good. Does that motion I achieve that the result, I, yeah. the result I, you're trying to yeah. get to? Is there a second to that? There was a second. I, I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nay. I can't make the just finding for the reduced setback. Yeah. Why I didn't want to make the motion. Oh, and I'm sorry. I didn't for it. want to put you in that position. <laughs> Nevertheless, you have an approval to keep the fireplace at six feet maximum. Best wishes. It's okay. It was coming. So the next item on the agenda is Newfeld residence at Grant Lane. My res Agenda is design reviewed for for the Newfeld residence at one Grant Lane. My residence and property I own lies within the exclusion zone, so I will not be participating in hearing on this item. I will turn it over to Vice Chair Anglin. Okay. So would the applicant like to make a presentation? Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> we have to get a staff report first. So Sandra, please. This is an application for design review to replace the horizontal wood siding on the residence with cultured stone and with a cement fiber um, siding for the remainder of the structure. The existing residence is a one-story wood-sided home with the front elevation facing north toward Grant Lane. It's a simple rectangular structure with a front porch and attached garage, and the main dwelling has a gable roof with a hip extension over the porch, and the garage has a gable end that's perpendicular to the building. Um, and you can see the um, building as it exists in the middle two drawings and the building as proposed on the top two drawings. Um, so the proposal is to replace the siding on the north elevation with cultured stone, and the stone would wrap three feet around each of the side building elevations by three feet. It's a facade treatment that's intended to change the front appearance of this ranch-style home, and the result is a heavily divided use of materials, as you can see here, the, the heavy stone on the front that transitions to um, the wood alternative, which is the cement fiber board on the side. Um, and it creates somewhat of a contrasting architectural statement, this treatment, because it's the use of a facade treatment. Um, so it's design review for those elements that's before you tonight for your consideration and your decision. Thank you. Any questions of staff? 
do you, I couldn't quite tell from the um, plans exactly where the wood fence hits the side of the building. And I asked this because we had a similar situation with the night project. And I can't see how far back from the corner. May, may I? Um, my name is Jeff Newbill. I'm the owner of the property. Um, there's a water closet right here. And the fence line is about three feet right of the water closet. So the stone would still be about, the fence is about, the top drawing is about halfway between the water closet and where the stone is. Thank you. Any other um, questions? Okay, would the applicant like to make a presentation? Please state your name and. Yeah. I'm Dennis York. I own Exterior Solutions. I've been contracted by Jeff Newfeld, who is a resident of San Diego, and managed to find a beautiful home up here where he's going to retire. It's his second home. And uh, he has a dream of designing it, the exterior, the way that's before you guys, and has hired me to bring that about. The cement fiber siding, it, that's really a, a non-issue. It's, uh, it's a great product. It doesn't burn. It's going to mimic what's existing. We're going to tear that off paper and just put new siding on. The issue is the front and the three-foot wraparound of the, uh, of the Coronado Stone. Now, I'm a siding, con I'm a siding contractor. I see uh, the use of stone or the people are getting really cheap. Now they're using vinyl, and it looks horrible. Uh, on doing like an entryway, they want to make an imprint on your entryway, and they'll do around the front door and stuff, and they'll use either vinyl, stone, shingles, whatever, just to break it up, just for the look. Now, this is the look that Jeff wants. This is his retirement home. This is what he's shooting for. And uh, so we brought it to you guys. You know, we, I do know you have to pull a permit. <laughs> Congratulations. And that's why we didn't do any work. <laughs> so here we are. One thing I want to add, you guys do have the book, right? This, the pitch. Yes. This is a little invasive because this is a two-story. People are going to look at this gable and go, oh, my God, that's a lot of stone up there. But realize that's a two-story two structure. And the structure that we're talking about is only this tall right here, and you're going to have a garage door. So it's not going to be that invasive as far as what this leads you to believe. That's about all I have. Anything I mean, this else? is this <laughs> pretty cut and dry job for okay. me. I mean, it's whether you guys like the stone or not. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, does your client think that he's getting this look? Yes. Okay. Yes. He thinks, Jeff is here today, he thinks he's getting this look here. Right. But what I see that's different between this cut sheet and the drawings that I have is that these windows are deeply set back from the face of the stone. Yes. This veneer is going to be essentially in the same plane as the windows. Exactly. Well, are you they, aware of that? Are you aware of that? I am. I am. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, three quarters of this frontage is six foot set back from the roof line, so it's set back. There's a there's a railing here, so it probably is at least as wide as from here to there. So it's it's set back a little more. It's only about seven feet tall, about right in here. Right. Right. So. Yes, I am aware of it. I, okay. I have it on my home. Uh, in uh, uh, one thing I, I would like you to do is is to state your name and. Oh, I, and okay, I'm sorry. I said Jeff Newfeld when I was showing. The right, and you're from San Diego. Yes, I am. Sorry. Okay, because this is being recorded, and we want to be able to pick okay. it up with the microphone and and who's speaking. So just if you walk over, grab the mic, and walk with you. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. What I was saying is. From, from this, the corner of the house up to the front door here, it's a, there's about a, approximately a six-foot setback. 
so it's not right on the front. Of, it's not right on the front, so it's not. It's this. not quite. It doesn't show as quite as much as you might think. It's this. Yes. Yes. So it's about six. It's about six feet back. And, then, and like Dennis was saying, the the garage door breaks up a lot of it, and it won't be quite that right. uh, ominous. And God is always in the details, and where you have dissimilar materials coming up against each other, that's where it either is made or, or broken. And in this particular application, you're taking the, the trim off the windows, correct? Yes. yes. And then you're just butting the stone up against, I mean, there's not even nailing flanges against there. How, how does that detail work at the windows? There is a, there's sills. There is actual material made to wrap windows. Because that's not in your application. I'm sorry about that. They, they make a sill plate that goes on that. I'm sorry. It goes above it like that. That's what it would look like on the four windows on the front. You want to see this? Yeah, we kind of hurried up and, and uh, contracted a architect and kind of just kind of blew through this to make sure we got into this meeting rather than next month. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry that I missed that detail. And uh, for the jams, the, the stone is just going to run up against the side of these windows. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, they're grouted. Right. So you'll see the thickness of the stone, which is not very thick at that location. Yeah, yeah it's float, it floats about a half inch thick, yes. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that on the side, too where it transitions no. from the the stone to the uh, hardy board? No. How does that work? Go ahead. I, I use what they call LP Smart Trim. It's a 50-year manufactured wood trim, and it's in the, the stats. And we'll run that down the length where the stone will meet with that. And then our siding it's starts on this side, the stone's on this side. So you'll have a three-and-a-half-inch piece of wood trim where the transition start. Okay. Any other questions from the, the board? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take some comments from thank the you. Uh, thank you. the public and then we'll discuss it. Any are, are there any people here tonight that would like to comment on this? Yes, please. I'm Paul Marciniak. I live at Two Grant Lane right across the uh, street from this place. I have no issue with uh, trying to integrate the stone with the uh, hardy board uh, in this particular part of the uh, part of town. We have a problem with the acorn woodpeckers, so this would be a, a very good <laughs> problem. In fact, uh, uh, two years ago, I had my siding replaced with the uh, hardy board, and it has effectively reduced the. Uh, impact of the acorn woodpeckers, they've been going to the neighbors now. So, <laughs> so now the next one is trying to <laughs> take care of that problem. Uh, they're very industrious. Um, uh, the stone uh, fits in with that part of the neighborhood since the old quarry is within a mile of that uh, uh, structure. So I don't really see uh, much issue with that. The only part that uh, maybe aesthetically, we would like uh, not so high on the garage to see the stone, but uh, that is not a major issue with me. So. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, welcome. Hi, I'm Marjean Marciniak, Paul's um, wife, and we live right across the street. We have the identical floor plan, and number one, we're thrilled that Jeff bought it and is improving it. We really appreciate that. And I'm the one that brought up the concern, and Paul agrees with me, that it's a private lane, so it's a narrow road. I mean, the distance, I didn't measure it, but the distance between the two houses is probably 60 feet. And yes, they're both single story. I'm just a little concerned as we sit in our front den, we call it, um, it's the middle windows. That's pretty much what we look at, is the garage. And yes, the porch is set back six feet, as is required in our historical district. 
through town, which we love. Um, it's not a huge issue, but it just seems a little massive, this, this rock. It's a nice look. I didn't see the brochure. It's interesting about the windows that you brought up. Didn't think about that. Um, so it's certainly not a deal breaker, but we're, we're wondering, wouldn't it look, still get the effect, but not have being the rock above the garage door, does that still work for Jeff? Because we think it would be better for us. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay, then uh, we'll end the public comment and we'll bring it back to the board. Anybody like to start? I'm, I'll go out and start. Uh, um, I don't think there's quite as rambunctious of a debate about this one, but um, my concern is the same concern we had for the night project, which is one of the things in the code is talks about facades and trying to get away from this facade uh, look. Um, and with the night project, uh, the stone only went up, I don't know, three, four feet, and it wrapped around the sides. And the way we dealt with it was the fence abutted. So for all intents and purposes, from the street, if you look down the side, the stone went, there was a fence. You didn't know that it ended two feet beyond that. Um, this case, it ends before the fence. So you're chopping up that wall quite a bit. Not only is the fence there breaking up that wall, but you're also chopping it with this three feet of stone that's then stopping. Um, so that's my primary concern with this particular. As far as the front goes, eh, I had the same reaction a little bit about that's a lot of stone that goes up there. Looking at this, um, I was hoping maybe we'd get a sample, but I'm assuming it's going to look very close to this. Um, not as concerned about that, more just the facade. We don't want it to look false or fake. And we've got great products out there that don't look like that from the front. But when you start looking at the sides and you see that it only goes around a little bit, that's where you start getting another, kind of like the windows. You start seeing the details of where, oh, it's just a facade. Well, I have, I have some comments. Um, I personally have um, sort of a, an aversion to facadism. And, uh, and what it is is it's really trying to make a building something that it's really not. And uh, you, you see it in lots of places, and it, it just never rings true to me. Uh, there, and in my mind, there are other options to that. And I asked Sandra to um, uh, show some slides of pictures. This, these pictures that I'm going to show are on Weber Street, which is just um, uh, across the street from where we are. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a block that's not unlike your private uh, lane. And all the houses were built pretty much at the same time and in this, sort of the same style. Um, they all have porches like this. This is starting at the corner where the park is and moving towards uh, Town Hall to the east. So the next picture, whoops, that's not the next picture. This is, um, well, actually, there's another picture before that one. And it's the second house in, which has. They're not in order. Oh, OK, just keep going. Well, this is the house that I really want to talk about. And um, this is a house, not unlike your house, that they sort of began with the integrity of the house. And instead of adding things in a pastiche kind of way, they really uh, went the design route of picking colors, changing the garage door, um, highlighting some of the, the elements there, and uh, bringing the landscape up into kind of a unique way. And I think this is more of the approach that I'd like to see in Old Town than uh, what we're looking at tonight. Um, I, I think it's very clear to me that even if the house was totally uh, covered with stone, it's not how it was built. I would much, much prefer the house to have the integrity of all stone than to have it wrap around the front, sort of like a mask on your face that sort of comes around a little bit. You can see that it's a mask. 
but you can really see that there's a face behind that. That's really what this, this stone is doing in my mind. And I really don't want to encourage that in Old Town. I, there's a real mixture of houses that are over 100 years old and houses that are 30 years old or 40 years old. But I would like to see the integrity of that period's building kind of as the starting point where you added on things like paint and landscaping and gates and uh, maybe changing the garage door out and maybe changing the windows out. But I'm, I'm not a big proponent of, of um, this kind of treatment. Um, and, and so I tend to not um, be very favorable to this. So I would pass it on to hearing what you other guys would say. I walk by this house every day to go to the park. And this is just where we differ. And I thought it was so unfortunate what they ended up doing to the place let alone the fact that there is a gym in the garage, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> I don't even know about the gym. That's a whole nother story. Um, I just, maybe this house, in my opinion, would be better served with some of this, but that's, <laughs> that's my opinion as well. So, um, And I know the owner, and I'll tell her I said that. But um, I, I drove over to, uh, to Grant, uh, Grant Street um, to look at it today, and... And my first reaction was that it was those four houses match each other exactly. And I thought by doing this that it would change the area dramatically. But at the same time, someone I was with uh, thought quite the opposite. He thought it would enhance the area. And the fence comes up quite almost to that point, yet yeah, it doesn't come to the end. But I think as you start going up that roof line, it creates a, it creates it becomes even more awkward if yeah. we, you were to make it come to the fence. So my my opinion, looking at this and based on Sandra's comments, is I, I think it's a I think it's a good addition to the area. I, I I hear what you're saying and I agree with a lot of it, but I think that this works well for this for this location. I'll go along with that, Jeff. It. Uh I went out there and looked at the area myself today, and uh, they are all the same. And this looks like a good step. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily for me, and I do agree with some of your comments about Old Town continuity and facades and all that, but uh, this looks like a pretty straightforward remodel to me, so I have no problem with it. you have any more to say? Well, I think... Um, I'd have difficulty approving it the way it is. I don't think I'm to the point of completely being against use of the stone, as you have mentioned. So I'm somewhere in between, but I don't feel like I could support it as is, um, which then maybe gets bounced back to the applicant about alternatives, because it appears like we might be two and two here. <laughs> So what, what kind of um, possibilities do you see that would make it more amenable to you? And I, I hate to keep using the night project. It's not that it's my favorite project of all time or anything, but something along the lines of what they did. Because I agree uh, with Jeff on the fact that if you pulled the entire stone, besides using a whole bunch of extra stone on the side of the house, um, or faux stone on the side of the house. If you pulled it all the way to the fence line, it'd look really odd because it would go almost all the way up to the peak of the roof. And I don't think that would look good either. So I think the accommodation would be more like having something that was four, four feet or something like that or what, and have that wrap all the way around, the at least to the fence. Yeah. Uh, and then have the hardy board to replace the wood on top of that. That would also take into account the neighbor's concern about that peak being all stone as well. I'm, I'm not as concerned about that. I'm more concerned with the appearance of a facade. I don't know how that would work with the windows. I, I um, you know, I, in my mind, it's kind of a broader issue because, you know, this is a house that you see that sometimes. And I, and I don't mean to be derogatory, this sort of peel and stick idea, 
to houses of this generation, um, but you see a, you, you do see this. What I'm concerned is, is, is about some of the older structures in town that you know, people decide, hey, I, I think I'd like to have this look like a stone building and do the same treatment essentially at the facade, but then it wraps around the corners and stops. I think the, the actually the more public side of this, aside from the neighbors across the street, is the side where you see that wraparound on Jefferson and you know that's that's really where it's so um, apparent that it's a facade and from my standpoint you know if that was done on an 1890s house or proposed on an 1890s house I'd be really offended by that um, this is me personally uh, speaking but uh, I don't want to set a precedent that says, oh, well, this, is, this actually does improve the looks of the house. And from my own personal opinion, I'm not sure if it does. I think that there are other kinds of treatments that could be um, proposed to deal with m improving the house. Um, I may be a, a, f a minority of one or two on this, but I do, and I'm not satisfied with the the east elevation, I, that doesn't work. And I think that some something has to be resolved around that. And I'm not sure if we're designing your house for you. I don't think that's really our job, but it is to comment on that. Um, so as it's proposed, I'm just not in favor of kind of the transitions. You know, we didn't see the kind of actual stone uh, sills and lentils. Um, I would, I would, want to see more detail of what actually is happening. And, I, and as I said, I'm not really um, very uh, supportive of the way that it transitions around the corners. So it may be a two to two, I don't know. Any other comments? So um, is there a, a proposal to uh, approve this amendment or this um, application? I propose that we approve the uh, plans as put forward here, maybe with the understanding that uh, the applicant could at least communicate with the neighbors about some other treatment above that garage area that might be visually appealing and still blend in with the whole motif of what you're trying to do there, but at least show some concern that you took a little input from your little four room, com four house community there, which is very sweet. And uh, I like to paint colors, and I, that's my proposal. I approve with suggestions from the neighbors. Yeah. Um, well, I, I probably can't support that. And what I, would, what I would say is that I would like to see more detail of the, the stones in interaction with the, the, the windows, the openings, the doors. Um, uh, the the way it turns the corner on the east and west elevations um, and I would propose that the applicant come back with more detail and and uh, maybe some discussion with the neighbors about what might be uh, amenable to everyone in that that uh, area but go ahead and and, and uh, if you want to make the the, uh, pro the motion the motion um, go ahead yeah, I'll make the motion. Okay, so, Sandra, do you have essentially the motion? Mm -hmm. the motion to approve. Member Gates' motion, not. Member not mine. No, no, no. That's right. Yeah. And is there a second? Yeah, is there a second to it? Well, the the comment that they should take the neighbor's suggestion is um, probably off. Meaningless, <laughs> because they don't have to follow that. So if that means something to you, that. Um, I like. No, you it can, doesn't. You can take that off the table then. All right. All right. I'll take that off the table. Okay, is there a second to that motion? I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Me. So it's uh, deadlocked at two to two. Now what happens? That motion failed, so you could choose, um, try to make another motion that you think you might get a majority opinion on. What I might propose is I think there needs to be more discussion and the applicant need to propose something else. I don't know if I would can motion. I feel like if I, 
like if I gave a motion for what I my opinion was, I feel like I'm designing their house. Can we and say something? Yes, come on. Yes, please. Since we're deadlocked, you know, maybe you can. <clears throat> This is my first time doing this, so you'll have to forgive me. This is Jeff Newfeld again of One Grant Lane. I'd be willing to do two changes on it that would make it uh, probably am very amenable to them and probably to yourselves, I would hope. Um, where it wraps around the east wall, he can use the same joint. I will make a, I'll, I'll take it to whatever code would let me take it to three feet or so, three and a half, whatever that is, all the way back to the fence. So it would meet the, the requirement of not breaking it up, you know, going from stone to siding to a, a gate and a fence. So I could, at the corner of the house, he could end it, whether it was 18 inches around or three feet, whatever you guys determine. Um, and then at that point, they have those sill plates. And I could do that all the way down to the fence line and end it. And then on the garage side as well, I would be willing Take the microphone. On the garage side as well, I would be willing to take use that same height, whatever it is here, and then on the 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 wall that goes this way here, here and around there, do the same thing. So, I I, I meet the one objection the, about the the height going too far or stopping before the fence. I, I feel their requirement of not looking at all that uh, stone all the way up around the garage and and. And I think it's fair enough to me. Now, on the face of the house, I would still like to, the part that's under the eave, would still like to go the distance. Okay. So um, how, how should we do this? Um, so it, it is, I think that we could make a motion that we incorporate what you've said and that the drawings, you'll, you'll have to update your drawings. Not a problem. And um, bring in the details that, that were not on these original drawings. And then bring them to staff for their approval. Um, and if, you, they, if they meet the standard of what we're looking for, what the committee's looking for, then uh, you can move forward. So, so I... I'm liking the direction of this. Um, I ask you maybe as the specific architect here, I'm struggling with that corner because it's still going to be a facade. I mean, if you ended at the corner, you wouldn't, if you're looking just from the east or just from, I think, the north? Yeah, the north, you wouldn't see that it was a facade. But with that corner, technically there would be it would be, I don't know, six, seven feet on the front. It would come to the corner, and then it would be three feet or whatever down the side. Yeah, Does see, that actually, you know, uh, thinking about that, maybe what I might do is to let it be a facade and don't wrap it around the corner, but to actually thicken the corner so that the it's like a wood pilaster. So it comes along the east elevation and it turns maybe a foot or 18 inches and it's proud of the stone by maybe 12 inches and then dies back in. And so the stone has a way of dying into it along the front elevation. And so from the side elevation, you'll see the hardy board. Mm -hmm. um, but the stone will be contained at that corner and at the other corner. I know exactly same, what you mean. The same. Make treatment. it look like it's real stone and it's wrapped on there instead of. Yeah, and see, flat. you don't, you're, and you're not going to be able to see the dimension of the stone because you'll never see it on end because it'll be dying into a corner like that. They make those in corners, so basically you'd come out across and back in, make it look like a real rock. Well, I mean, essentially, I'm saying that it would be actually your hardy board, that it would be like a, a wooden plaster, pilaster. I think you're talking about, I'm Dennis Shork, Exterior Solutions. I think you're talking about if you're looking at it from the side of the house, you're not going to see the stone. You're going to see a wood facade. Or a exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, we can and essentially that. the stone dies in behind that so you yes. don't get the sense of it's, it's like, like that. It's reversed of that. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you never get a sense of how deep it is and you, you're really depending on the shadow lines of the, the cultured stone to give you the sense of that. But I would do that on both ends so that Not a problem. maybe you don't do this, this wainscoting at all, but you, you do that 
across your facade and yeah. and maybe you do some uh, other treatment in the the gable end of your garage so it doesn't I mean, you could have a big vent up there so I don't know you know come come spring I'll be submitting plans for uh, a, a landscape as well I don't want you to think that I'm just doing this stone and leaving everything the same I'm gonna have a professional design everything and and make it fit the motif of the Neighborhood. Yeah, I think that I think with these sort of pilasters, you you'll be able to contain the stone and actually give it a sense that it's much thicker than it is. And then I would recommend that you show us details of all the openings around doors and windows. I mean, I know you have the El Dorado stone pictures, but yeah, I, I'm not sure I understood that yeah, one. Yeah, if he wants to see how the windows. How the stone interacts with the windows, whatever way. We're, whatever. See, we have these drawings here on uh, that were prepared. And essentially, they show the stone being applied right to um, building paper in a scratch coat. That's it. That's the way it doesn't show anything. It doesn't show anything at all about the the something like this. Now, what you're saying is that you have these stone. Um, sills and lentils, yes. mm -hmm. but then how does the the jam work? I mean, is that just going to be really on either side? Is it going to be deep like this, or is it going to be flat? No, they'll probably be, be only a couple three three or four inches max. They won't be quite that deep. Yeah. The See, windows only have a small trim on them. See, that's why I'm asking that you provide details so that the the um, planning department can see what that's going to look like. Um, I can do that. Yeah, I, I think that'll make a big difference because you know, oftentimes people come here and they and they show us a brochure like this and say we're just going to do it like this, and when it gets built, it doesn't turn out that way. So it's often really important to us to to see what the details are going to look like that you're going to build from. That being said, my house is San Diego. I've done not that brand, but similar stone to it. So I am familiar with how it, it's applied and how it looks and whether it's the sills or the lentils and all. Okay. I don't want to I think this is my just first experience at this. Yeah. Well, you know, I know this product, so it's, and I know that it's, it's, it's either successful or fails by the way that it's applied. And so I, I'd like to be assured that it's, we're going to see beforehand, not after it's all up. So how do we want to make a proposal on this? Um, if you're going to do this by condition and it's not going to return to you, then we need to be clear at staff level of how deep the inset is and the, the pilasters are. I'm getting at the corners. There is there going to be no return, but you want a um, casting a shadow line at the corners where it transitions. I and want something. The windows that, are inset. Yeah. How far? So we don't get it too shallow and I don't think we'll get it too deep but I think I am afraid of getting it too shallow yeah I am too so um, are, did you just come up for this meeting or yeah here's the thing about the windows you guys it's the windows are already in we're not changing the windows out so you're only gonna have the depth of the stone after we take off the existing siding so that's already predetermined unless you want unless you're gonna tell me you want me to do something now I'm not going to. Oh, I'm not going to make you. You know. Do I got to tear the windows redesign. off, push them back? No, yeah. I mean that's. No, we, we're we're not in a position to do that. To tell you to do the that. The sill plates, the dimensions for the sill plates are right mm -hmm. on the brochure. I just have this. Um, uh, he'll get it for us. I think they're three and a half inches. So you're basically your sill plate would be about three and a half inches. Oh, I Sure. Security might get you. But. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the sill plates are five inches deep. Or no, I'm sorry, two and a half. Uh, the length of, all your measurements are right there. So. Right, right. Two and a half. Split stone or just hold on. Oh, okay. She has the book. That's right. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, I mean, from my standpoint, I'm concerned about the corners and how the the stone, so I'd like to see that, but 
than I'm coming back to your staff for review. I was going to say, I imagine your goal is you don't want to return here or wait till January to do anything in return. You know, and I didn't, I heard so much personal stuff here, I got tired of sitting here, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I could tell you my guys aren't working, I'd like to get them on the job, you know, and stuff like that. For the economy. But I'm, but I'm going we to understand save that. all that stuff. No, go ahead. I'm going to save all that stuff. Jeff has a dream, I want to realize it for him. We need your permission. Tell us what you want us to do, we'll do it. Okay, we will. Um, what I'd like to do is we can um, have a review of the application. Can we do that? So this is not a building permit application. No, I do. Yes, it is. Yes, it, it is. I submitted a building permit application. And, that's, and it's based on this. But we don't see the sills or, the, yeah. or any of that. Well, you, that's the thing you don't see is the sills. Maybe you have everything else. Colors. I'm sorry. You could. <laughs> the, 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 the way it is right now, the windows are right next to the side. No, I understand. Don't I, sit. I'm going to create, actually, going to create, not quite that deep, but I'm going to create a sill by the time the stone comes out. And no, I understand. You could create a subcommittee to review and approve the drawings that they're submitting as long as it doesn't constitute a quorum, so we have a Brown Act violation. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to elect one or two members to approve the drawing, the revised drawings that are submitted in consideration of the recommendations given to the applicant tonight? Or, we, okay. Could, okay. or we could just make recommendations to you and it can be done on your level, correct? Yes. Okay. But, but your request has been to be very so specific about the sizes of right. exactly. everything. Yes. I, I, so what I would like to do yeah. is I'd like to have a committee. I, I, we'll approve this, uh, but I would like to have a committee to review um, your application um, and with uh, and to see that the recommendations that we're talking about and hopefully you get it um, are incorporated into what you're doing and then it would just be a sign off so you want window detail and the, uh, the corner details right pretty much and and yeah do you understand what he means by the corner? Uh, yeah, what he wants to basically it sticks out to where it looks like a real rock instead of just a flat mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think he means no. that. Mm -hmm. I think he means the opposite. Is there a cap on the where there's not going to be a wainscot. Okay. Okay. I'll draw it for you. Is, is, can you bring up that picture again? I'm sorry. You guys. Go like that instead of flat, flush with the wood. The opposite way. That's no. it. It's the opposite. So the wood is out beyond the, the face of the stone. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you want no stone here. It's going to be Bring the wood. mic. So if you're looking at from this angle, oh, I see you can't see any stone. Oh, that's, that's how long I'm standing. Good. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Here, this is what I'm talking about right here. This is your corner. This is your corner. This is the east. The wood comes around, wraps around like that, and then the stone comes on. You just pull this out. It doesn't have to even be very far. It's enough to let the stone die into there so you don't get a side profile of that. You'll have your windows there like that. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, so, so looking from the east to the west, I don't see the stone. Right. Exactly. I'll, put a, I'll right. put a piece of wood trim. I'll put a piece of wood trim on both corners, dive it into it, and we're done. And then it'll dive back. On yeah. The That's why it's, it's very simple for me to take a look at it and know if you've got the spirit of it. Yeah, I, I am fine with it. And, and I could be a committee of one or it could be a committee of Rob. Do you want to be a part of this? Anybody I, could be a part of the subcommittee. I, I think the two nays should be a part of this. Okay. No, I, no, I think that's probably appropriate. I agree. I agree. I have no, I agree minute, completely. I think we ought to break it. I think no, no, there no, should no, be no. A, no. a yay and a nay at least. But they're both, <laughs> a yay they're, and both a on, <laughs> they're both on board with what you're talking about now, correct? Well, so. No. Okay. <laughs> this is I I was letting this go because if you agree with this and the two of you agree with it, then we move forward. Oh, okay. I still think this constitutes a facade, even more so now than it did before. And I still don't think that's what we're looking for in Old Town. Um, so okay. I think this change, while it makes it look a little less like a facade, it's even more so of a facade. So. If you're okay with it, and the two, if you're okay with it, then it can move forward. But I wouldn't put me on a subcommittee because I don't okay. <laughs> agree with. 
I, I love facades, and, and I like lipstick, powder, and paint, too, because they, they sure make <laughs> women look beautiful. So, Rob, what do you think we should do? I, I, I gave my suggestion. But are we not clear on what they need to do and that Rob will be the committee of one? Rob Angler? Well, okay. the, the, the other Rob so is not happy with that, so. But but we don't need to be unanimous. We just need to be a majority. So if three of you are okay with that and you want to be the subcommittee, then. I'm fine with it. Okay. Absolutely. Then I propose that um, you, you sure. present your drawings with, expand on what you're, you're presenting and um, present it to our planners and then they'll contact me. I'll review it and uh, give my input and then you should be good. That's a condition. Are you going to make a motion and a second? To that effect. Um, yeah, I'll make a motion that uh, the application um, be approved pending a review by a committee, a subcommittee of the ZDRB. And um, based on that review, um, further modifications may have to be made, um, and maybe not. And, and uh, once that's been done, then the permit could go forth. And so that's my motion. Are there seconds? I second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Okay. Thank you. Is that clear? Yeah. It, 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 do you want me to go back to the architect, bring new uh, color drawings and things like this? Or just window detail and corner detail? I, I want you to show where the stone is going to be on the elevations, so as you've done here. Okay. And then show the details of, of the transitions at the corners and at the windows, wherever the stone comes in contact with the windows and doors and the garage door. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Okay. We're just rolling along. Thank you for being patient and waiting. Are 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 you willing to go forward, or would you would you like to take a break? Just go forward. Okay. The chair is coming back. Okay. Thank you. So we'll turn the the committee back to our chair. Thank we'll you, go Mr. Anglin. So we are now on 8.3, yes, an MD plea for Heston Vineyards on Washington Street. <clears throat> and Sandra, for a master development plan, we're just providing comments, correct? Correct. Okay, so we'll take no action tonight. We'll just provide recommendations through council. So, uh, pray go ahead with a report. This is a master development plan to redevelop the subject property that's located between Gates Estates and the Edward James Courtyard. Um, as you know or recall, this property was rezoned in 2010 from a residential land use designation to a commercial land use designation. Um, and it's currently developed with two residential structures. One is a single family dwelling and the other is a triplex. The applicant proposes a complete redevelopment of the property that would include um, raising both structures, a portion of the Gates Estate concrete wall that encroaches onto the property, removing the driveway and all site paving as well as all existing landscaping and trees. Proposed is a 2,440 square foot um, structure that would consist of a ground floor of approximately 1,400 square feet of commercial space that would be wine tasting and cookware retail. Shown here on the lower um, drawing. And the second floor would be an approximately 1,040 square foot uh, residential space for two residential units. One would be a studio and the other would be a one bedroom. When the rezone was approved, a concept for redevelopment of the property was brought forth and this included 
uh, the uses you see before you tonight, the wine tasting and retail, plus the residential uses. And the residential uses were required for the rezone of the property and um, the expected commercial uses. The, the two residential units will each feature a balcony and large um, openings of windows on the south and east building elevations, but there are no openings proposed for the north elevation, which will feature a zero lot line. Um, and as to setbacks, as I just mentioned, it's a zero lot line on the north side, um, but the building steps back in this location, so it's not for the full height of the building, um, but for a portion, um, and then it will increase. The front setback is a 15-foot setback. The south side setback would be 21 feet, and the rear setback would be 47 feet. The height would be, of the building is proposed to be a little over 14 feet to first floor plate height, a little over 20 feet to second floor plate height, and a total height of 29 feet 6 inches. And this includes a mechanical room above the second um, story. And the roof line is angular with several different treatments, as you see here. Um, proposed site paving includes a 14-foot wide driveway on the south side of the lot, which would provide access to a rear-situated parking lot. The parking lot uh, will include two, two spaces for uh, two covered spaces for the residential uses and six open and uncovered spaces for the commercial use. Um, and the lot will be separated from adjoining uses from a landscape planter that will range in width from six inches to five feet. There's a five foot wide set, um, sidewalk proposed to provide access between the rear, between the parking lot and the rear of the structure, and that's for both uses. Um, Turf block pavers are proposed for the first segment of the driveway and for the front patio. And a new four foot wide sidewalk is proposed for the street side of the property. A landscape plan was submitted and while it's very conceptual, it does include details for a privet hedge and planters along um, the southeast and a portion of the north. Um, parking lots and driveways. A lighting plan is proposed and it includes directional well lights for the building, uh, cove lights at the barrel room and low level bollards for the parking lot. And a trash enclosure is also proposed um, for all of the uses on site and it's enclosed within the building. The subject property is located within the residential scaled commercial zoning district and this is a district intended for commercial uses and structures. Um, but the intent is that these structures and uses have the appropriate transition to adjacent residential neighborhoods. Um, and in this case, there are residential neighborhoods that abut the north and a portion of the north and the east um, um, property lines. And the special RSC standards require that commercial development is of a use, scale, and intensity that preserves and promotes the town's rural character and scale. And that building height, massing, and size is of a residential scale and compatible with residential development. And as you see in the elevation drawings, the combination um, of building elements results in a somewhat heavy massing, and this is even though there are sections of the building that are stepped back, um, mainly on Washington Street and um, in the north property line. Um, and this may or may not be entirely compatible with the adjacent residential neighborhood. Um, the building also makes a very strong architectural statement. And from a contextual perspective, it raises the question of compatibility with the collective of the block. And as you know, there's the farmhouse style complex of Edward James Courtyard. There's the simple form of the Gates Estates. And then there's the old Grosinger Mansion across the street, which is a structure listed in the town's historic resource um, inventory. So. Those are the general standards that apply to the re residential scale commercial district. There are also design standards um, in the design guidelines um, that must be met. And this project generally complies with those. Um, staff, however, just wants to make a couple comments on some of the elements of the project. Um, one is the zero setback on the north property line. And recognition is made that this is a small parcel and options are quite limited. And it makes use of a zero lot line 
um, a nice feature for maximization of the property. Um, in this case, the zero lot line abets a residential um, property and zoning district rather than a commercial one, so the impacts may be greater. Um, but if we were to flip the driveway and the, the building, it would just move vehicle impacts adjacent to that property line. Um, and there may also be visibility issues associated um, with exiting because of the location proximity to the corner, and also the Gates Estate Building, which sits at the back of the sidewalk. Um, as to building height at 29 feet 6 inches, it's within the maximum allowed height of 30 feet. Um, but as I earlier mentioned, the mechanical room um, creates the appearance of a third story, and it has an 8-foot indoor building height. Um, and it's um, responsible for some of the heavy building massing that results. Um, However, the benefit of having an enclosed mechanical room is that any noise impacts are mitigated, um, but staff hopes this could still be achieved with a reduced mechanical room height um, that mitigates some of that uppermost massing. Um, with, re in regards to the parking lot, since it's a commercial use at Willabet residential uh, properties, it will be required to have a six-foot tall fence, and it should be a CMU or other sound attenuating construction because of the sensitivity of the adjoining um, uh, residential use, which has become the standard imposed by the ZDRB. Um, has that standard been codified? It hasn't, no. Okay, thank you. Um, staff also notes that um, the landscape drawings don't show a tree for the parking lot, and so one should be included in the revised submittal. Um, but staff does want to comment that it's very supportive of the use of the low-level bollards to light the parking lot uh, because of the way they're able to contain the lighting source and reduce spillage to the surrounding residential properties. Um, the trash enclosure is proposed to be 19 square feet, um, and it has a somewhat odd configuration. It's um, deeper than it is wide, and there will be three different uses sharing that enclosure. Um, and there are no unused areas on the parcel that be, could be used to accommodate an expansion in the future, so staff suggests that the applicant consider um, increasing its size. And lastly, I'd like to comment that there are special design review requirements, and the ZDRB can require the installation of story poles to illustrate the 3D massing of the building if you believe it's necessary to evaluate the impacts of the project. Um, and based on the zero lot line on the north side and the heavy building massing, staff suggests that it could be useful in this instance, but it's a decision for you to make. Um, as Chair Jane's mentioned, you sit in an advisory capacity project, and so tonight you're to review the project and provide recommendations to the applicant and our council if it's ready to move before them. And that's Thank you. Very nicely done, as always, Sandra. Any questions of staff before we hear from the applicant? Um, I have a couple, and it was the it was a very thorough report. So thank you. It helped me quite a bit. Um, so when it was rezoned uh, to its current zoning, housing was a component of it. But how many units was there? Units number of units determined only that housing was to be a component. There was discussion between two and four units, but it was well understood that the property couldn't really accommodate four units and still have a commercial commercial use and be effective um, for both. So there was, um, it was sort of settled upon that two would meet the standard. Is that cast in stone? In other words, it, if they don't meet the two requirements, then they can't go forward with their project? I think that would be a, a problem at council because they um, wanted to see some replacement housing. Okay, so that's that was the the uh, rationale. It was replacement housing for what was being lost. There are um, two triggers for the the housing, and one is w when you rezone a property from commercial I mean, from residential to commercial, you have to replace the lost housing units. In this case, we're losing four units, but you also have to provide housing for one half of the anticipated employees, which adds on an additional housing burden. Um, and so, the fair compromise was two units will probably work. Okay. Because there was some discussion of whether you could actually legally fit four units back on that property now because the original ones were carryover, right? Like if we tried to fit those same dwellings on the same property now, it would be a struggle. Right. Under and the and to meet setback and different requirements. In the open space. Building. Yeah. Too. Exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, another question I have is, um, does the the building code uh, prevail in terms of openings in side yards or in yards? So in other words, uh, when you're building a, to a zero lot clearance, the, the building code requires that you can't have any openings within a certain distance from that. Correct. Um, and other fire safety wall issues. Right. So, but that. if it was five feet and you were building a house, you could have openings within that side yard, for instance. Which applies here? Does, does that apply? Uh, you're allowed to have protected openings within five feet. Um, and 10 feet, I think, is, is unprotected. Yeah, within three feet, no openings. Uh, three yeah, to so isn't it not true between three to five there's a calculation based on the total area of the openings of the wall yeah yeah and you can have a combination of protected and unprotected right so in other words with it within five feet of a property line you can't have openings and it's it's based on a formula and it's a combination of protected and unprotected and there is an opening here but it's in the well located right here and it's probably set and back. And it's facing in, inward and set back from the corner, although I haven't measured out that distance yet. Right. It looks like it, it's probably within the area where you can have an unprotected opening. Okay. And, and this is a, an advisory review. It's not a decision-making review. Correct. Okay. That's, those are my questions. I, I do have a question because um, there was some comment in the report, but you didn't, I didn't feel like you touched on it, or I zoned out, sorry, um, about the wall for the parking, that there is a requirement to have a wall. Screening. Mr. Cray. Um, and that there was discussion in the report that that wasn't part of the plans, but that the applicants were going to, uh, you know, comply with right. it. Right. That was part of my... Um, original presentation, okay. but you're correct that um, what kind of a wall are we talking about? I'm just looking at the backyard here of what the resident behind is dealing with. And are we talking a six foot cement cinder block wall that we're putting on their line? Yes, very similar to what was approved at Summerston. It's a masonry wall with a stucco exterior, um, it's not bare exposed CMU, uh, but it's another, not. If I may, there's another great example separating the community center from oh, Ivy probably. Court right. where it's integral color split face CMU. Okay. Correct. So in fact the the residences are faced with a finished surface without needing anybody climbing in their yards. And it also meets the requirement of six feet. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it looks like we're gonna have trouble with some trees that are on the rear properties line but mm -hmm. bend over within that six foot limit. Mm. Um, so I don't know if we're going to build the wall around or fence around those trees or if those trees, what property they're technically on. Um, so I was a little curious about that, but we can do leave that for comments. Got it. Here, here, here. Any other questions of staff? Yeah, I have one. Uh, Sandra, now there is no defined sidewalk nor driveway on that property. It's just asphalt to asphalt from one end to the other, from across the street to the back. So what I see here is a sidewalk with the pavers with grass in between to delineate the, the transition almost? At the back of sidewalk, yes. Oh, for the driveway? Uh, yeah, for the driveway. So if... So your concerns about um, right now the driveway is next to Gate Estates and is next to that side where all the cars enter and exit. It's a residential property, though, so it doesn't have the same level of um, vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say a number of trips <laughs> per day. I have two questions. Are the housing units inclusionary? No. Is the old post office a retained use or was it zoning changed it's previously? Zoning was changed as well. It's a RSC property. Okay. We'd love to hear from the applicant. Oh, let me clarify one thing and then, but they it was retained use up until 
the, the change of this year. 2010 rezoning, okay. right. Sorry. Good evening. Um, my name is Farah Esalat. I'm the architect for the project. This works um, I'm here to um, represent the project and also respond to some of the comments that uh, we received uh, last Friday um, from the um, planners. Um, I just want to present this with you. I think I had it before, but why don't you just give it actually? Vineyard State. Thank you. The proposals before you are for a mixed-use development consisting of a commercial space to be used for retailing mayor cookware and as a tasting room for Heston wines and two residential units as required by the town to be included in the development. Um, as indicated on the drawings and the staff report, the proposals fall well within the parameters set by the town's ordinances with respect to the floor area ratios allowed, height limits on first and second floors and overall approach. I'll touch on each of these as I describe the design concept and how the overall project was developed. As is pointed out in the staff report, the site is small and constricted and provided many challenges in accommodating the retail space and the required residential units. While the owners of the project wanted to maximize the retail space to be allowed 25% of the lot area, after reviewing different options, it became clear that that was not possible and we could only get 19.5% of the lot. In addition, the two apartments could not be accommodated at ground level for lack of site area would have to be placed on the second floor as they are in the design project. Having arrived at the given areas and the required parking, we set about developing a general concept of how to distribute these areas on the site. From get-go, our aim was to develop an aesthetically attractive addition to the street, and this led us to three overriding design parameters. One was to set the parking area at the back of the lot behind the building at the expense of losing valuable retail space. Two, develop a one-story structure along the street frontage in keeping with the existing buildings on either side. And three, locate the residential units as far back as possible from the street and reduce the massing of the building along the street frontage. The lot being as narrow as it is with the 14-foot required driveway along one side, we were left with a narrow strip of land from a property line to the driveway, giving us a zero lot line envelope placed up or down on the lot. We chose to place the driveway on the south side of the property for the following reasons. From an urban design perspective, with the open parking area to the south, in lieu of what is there now, we wanted to open up the side of the property and present the more interesting side of the new building to the onlookers on Washington Street. We feel this is in keeping with our original intention of adding something of aesthetic value to the street, whereas placing a blank wall on this side would have been detrimental to the overall streetscape. Two, with the driveway placed on the south side of the property, it has the least impact on the residences to the north and away from the intersection. Three, again with the narrowness of the buildable strip, the second story residential units and their decks end up mostly facing the driveway. Placing the driveway on the north side would result in the windows and the decks of the apartments looking directly into the adjacent property and negatively impacting the adjacent houses on that side. With this arrangement, they look over the driveway south to the adjacent parking lot The row of trees along this property line, alongside the parking, will soften the view for the units themselves. 
And lastly, from a green building point of view, it's advantageous to place the residential units facing south to take advantage of the sun for lighting and winter heating. The building itself consists of one-story retail space in the front and the residential units in the back. The one-story portion is designed with a plate height less than that called for by the town restrictions. It is more or less the same height as the Gray State Building to the north, except that along that property line, it is set back an additional seven feet to not block the windows of that building. The front of the building is mostly glazed as a shop front to allow visual access to the interior of the retail space with the entrance to one side. The barrel-shaped bay window along the driveway side provides display shelves for the cookware on the inside and references the shape of wine barrels on the exterior. Horizontal planes and wood lattices in this elevation are used purposefully to lower the profile of the building and provide shading. The two residential units are partially stacked above the retail space and the required two covered parking spaces in the back. In a previous design that I shared with Bob, these units sat squarely on the first floor and were more visible from the street. In this version, as presented, we introduced a gently pitched standing sea metal roof similar to the town community center and more residential in character to cover the first floor and the second floor in one sweep and hence disguise the second floor from Washington Street. The sweep of the roof is broken along its rise by a hidden skylight that lights the retail space below and provides some architectural interest on the street side. The units are placed along the driveway with their decks covered by a balcony that shades the windows in summer. Uh, I'm sorry, covered by a canopy that shades the windows in summer and provides a strong horizontal layering with a reference to Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House. The pilotes in the back provide covered parking and integrate that requirement architecturally with the building. Above the residential units, we have provided attic space still within the height limit to allow for mechanical equipment and possibly some storage. Again, a point well taken in discussion with Bob as to lack of adequate storage in most residential development. While providing this, the attic over the forward unit screens from Washington Street, the pitch roof in the back that will carry solar panels. In presenting the proposals as they are, we feel that within all the restrictions of the lot, we have accomplished our aim of providing the owners and the town with a functional and aesthetically pleasing building while adhering to all the zoning ordinances. The staff report is positive on all aspects of the design compliance with the ordinances but goes on to comment on the scale of the building as not being residential. Our assumption is that the reference is not so much to the scale and size of the building, because that's a given, but more so to the contemporary aesthetic of the design. On Washington Street, if a line is drawn from the Gray State Building to Bouchon Restaurant, the proposed front of this building would fall when in line with it. The back of the building has a lesser massing as the existing two-story triplex, which almost occupies the entire back of the property. The only difference being that it's not freestanding and is one with the retail part. The height of the building at the back consists of two floors, each nine feet tall. The attic above was introduced to house the mechanical equipment out of sight. And a note in the staff report commends this as a positive for the project. As regards the use of a contemporary vocabulary of design, we feel that it is a true and honest response to the mixed-use nature of the building, as was used in the community center and Bardesino. Our website shows that we're very familiar with residential design, with over 100 houses as such, in a variety of styles, but here we felt that to use a residential style was inappropriate and would make the building nothing more than a pastiche. The project as it stands with its use of high quality natural materials, layering of its formal elements, its attention to detail, we feel will be a building of its own time and stand as an attractive addition to the town. In closing, 
We received the staff report last Friday and have uh, scrambled over the weekend to address some of the issues that were brought up. Uh, on the plans that I have with me, trees have been added on the landscape plan in the rear of the property. A curb has been indicated in the parking area to stop vehicles from driving onto the landscape areas. An additional trash enclosure has been added to the plans in the rear. And as agreed previously, a concrete masonry wall is now shown on the plans along the easterly property line of the parking area. And finally, we have with us a revision to the front frontage, which further lowers the lines of the building on Washington Street, and we propose it as an acceptable alt alternate for your consideration. And that's the rendering on that uh, side against the wall. Thanks very much. I'm sure we'll have some questions for you, so if you take a seat, I'm going to open it up to any other members of the public who wish to comment on the project before we ask questions. Anyone? Ferris? I see the slide that shows the house that I rent on Humboldt Street. I'm sorry, my name is Kathleen Braun. I live at 2080 Humboldt Street. Hi. Which is going to, well, it's that house right there that backs up. Um, yes. Um, we're, the back of the house juts out right there. That is a bedroom back there. And right now, with the trees overgrown, it's, it's a little dark. All winter, it stays wet. From what I understand, that this building is going to block all of the bedroom windows all the way over to the living room window. And when I walk out in the backyard, all I'm going to see is this great big building going up. There's nothing wrong. I absolutely love this building. <laughs> it is just great. But I'm very concerned about the fact that from the back windows there to that fence is probably not more than maybe under six feet. I can almost touch my bedroom windows and that back fence and just be short about this much. It's extremely narrow back there. There are a lot of trees along there, um, but with this right up against that fence there, I'm having real problems losing all that light back there. Um, with that building going up, there's going to be actually no sunshine coming back through there. This is a very old house. You know it's the old post office. Um, it's wet back there in the winter. It stays wet until the summer comes around. Now it looks like it's going to be all dark back there. And those bedroom windows are going to see nothing but that fence and then that building going up. Um, I don't have a solution for it. I really like it. I think it's a, a, a great addition to that. Anything to get rid of that old property back there. Um, I understand there's two residential units. I would like to know, have some assurances that whoever rents those units are going to be quiet because right now I call the sheriff once a week to have them come out and quiet those people down that are already there. That it's a nuisance. I will interject for a moment. I share your concern. I have dogs barking near me suddenly now, which dogs, loud people. It's not within our purview to impose any condition mm -hmm. on the occupants of the rental units. Okay. It, it's simply something we have no power even to suggest. Okay. Uh, but I, again, I am concerned about the fact that it's going to be completely dark back there. <clears throat> and, um, but on the other hand, I like the design. I think it's great. But I, I don't have any solutions about what to do about that um, because we are so close to one another. Can I ask a question? Um, we always, I'm, I'm actually glad you're here because we always just have to make kind of assumptions when we're talking about, well, would people rather have a driveway next to their house or a building next to their house or something's got to go somewhere. I mean, we're all neighbors. I, I agree. So the other proposal, which doesn't sound like the applicant wants it, but I'm asking you, is what if they flip the property instead of having a giant building right next to you, you had the driveway? Would that be preferable to you? There would still be a wall there, right? There would be some sort of fence or something, yeah. Our yeah. typical condition has been to impose it be solid, whether CMU. Well, I don't mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm gathering from the sweatshirt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. You're talking about a six foot high wall. Could it be six foot? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's fine. I mean, the the fence there's about six feet tall anyway, and and I would welcome a solid wall back there. That would be great. 
um, as far as flipping the property. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I, like I said, I, I don't have any solutions here. I'm, I understand then they would be looking over into my property, but there would be a six-foot wall there. Um, I like it. It's just that I'm also concerned about that mechanical building being way up on the top there. It's, it's a long way up. Um, I really don't mind it actually being where it's at. It's just I'm concerned about the total overall height of all that. Um, is there something that can be done different? Or I don't know. That's just my concern is um, we're a lot closer than that drawing looks. We really are. So if I were going to force you into a dichotomous decision of <laughs> either it's the driveways on the south. I mean, somebody's going to have to build there eventually. Right. So either the driveways on the south or the driveways on the north. What would be your preference if I had to make you? Because, I mean, somebody's going to come in here and have to put a driveway somewhere. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I would actually prefer to have a driveway there, but like it you know, is now, because that's where the driveway is now, is along your back fence. Um, pretty much, yes. Um, anything's going to create noise, um, but it's just that uh, I just was wondering if it could be like redesigned, or does it have to go that high? Um, I, I, said, I like it. I think it's. I think it's great. I love this kind of architecture. I think it would be look wonderful in there, and I'm glad somebody's putting something in there. Um, it's just that, again, I am very concerned that it's a lot closer than the drawing here looks. Okay, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Anyone else from the audience who'd like to comment on the project? No one. So I think now's our time to ask questions of the applicant. Who'd like to begin? Anyone have questions of the applicant? Rob? Where to begin? Well, at the end. You know, I, I commend you on, on meeting all the zoning requirements because it's a, it's a complex kind of puzzle that you're putting together, and, and you did that very well. Um, the problem that I have is, and I'm sure it's obvious to you, is that this is called residential zone, residential scale commercial. And as the last speaker spoke, from her standpoint, it's not residential at all. Essentially, you're going to have this blank wall that's going to vary, but it'll be up to 20 feet, 28 feet high, probably CMU because it's a property line. Uh, looking right, she'll see that anytime she looks out the back of her house. From a shading standpoint, I think that she'll be in shade most of the time because of the shadow that, that your, the building is going to cast. Um, I, I just don't, and this is my own personal opinion, but I just don't think that contemporary style of architecture is in keeping with the context of our, of our town. I, I, when I went, was in school, uh, a professor at Cornell University, Colin Rowe, um, put forth a, a, this whole kind of um, contextualism that buildings are always in relationship to the, the environment around them. And I think that that's really a guiding force in our town. At least that's what our design guidelines try to accomplish is that there's a context here. There is a context that each building, I think, in an ideal world should respond to the, con the context on all sides. And I think the staff report brought up what the context is of that, the surrounding buildings. Um, I think the scale is too large on that north side for the, the surrounding buildings. And there's no kind of relationship between the building, especially on that side, and the 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 buildings to the north of that. Um, you know, from a plan standpoint, I, 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 I think it, it works. I, I personally would like to see the plan flipped, and I, and I know it's a challenge to make that work because you're going to be on a side where you want to have as many windows as you can, and you're going to be kind of in a position where the code is going to kind of force you to deal with that. Um, um, Robert, may, for, may I interject there? <laughs> There if, was a question. What's Sorry, that? Sorry, no, no. Sure. If we were to flip it, I don't think we would have any issues because then we would be 
more than 14 feet away from the property line as far as exactly yeah. so there would be no issues as far as fire or windows or whatever it would just be a matter of having privacy issues where well, you, we would have the windows and the decks hanging over the adjacent properties well you wouldn't be able to have them hanging over but um, I think you'll I, still I have vision. I understand but you'll still have the issue of um, the property line to the south still have the setbacks from that in terms of openings and things like that um, so if you well, we would then have a solid wall on that side on the south side adjacent to the parking right if you pursue this design I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, I like the mixture of it I guess it's in my mind uh, the fact that you have to have two units makes it very challenging for you because you have to fill up the space um, with parking parking is as big an issue as as a point of order mr. England now's the time to ask questions of the applicant we're gathering data it oh. sounds as though you're summarizing oh, okay. so let's ask, well, that's what I was asking. So okay, forgive sorry. me let's yeah, ask right, questions right. and then you're summarize right. at the end you're right sorry quite all right anyone else with questions for the applicant one question are the balconies for the apartments and whatever's on the balcony is going to be visible from the sidewalk from the Washington Street sidewalk Correct. no they're all tucked behind the well it's in the back mm -hmm. Essentially, what's visible from Washington, from Washington Street is, from here back, very little is visible because it's all behind this. So the corner of the property is actually here. So when the trees are in bloom here, this portion of the building is actually not visible from Washington Street. It's mostly the front. It's the 25 feet, which is the storefront that's visible from the street. The rest of it goes down the side of the driveway and it's not visible unless you get onto this parking and if the trees are down then you can see most of it but during the summer when we were here photographing it you can actually can't see much of this because of the trees so this is the portion that's visible this is one of the terraces and then the other ones back there and it falls behind this and then the other ones way back on the parking lot Okay, thank you. Any questions of the applicant? No. I, I just have one question for you. And as the applicant, you're representing and speaking on behalf of the owner. Yes. Do you have any objection to being a condition being imposed that requires you to install CMU or plastered cast in place concrete walls separating the property from residential property? No, we had agreed to that previously. Great. Thanks very and, much. And I have a plan with me that now shows that and shows the trees and the various other items. There were, I think, four or five items that were requested in the staff the yes, report. The yes was great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm delighted to hear that, to know that you've already incorporated that. So do we have any questions of further questions of the applicant? No. Thank you very much. Um, we may ask you to come back again. I think Planning Director Tiernan would like to speak. There's one element of the building that uh, I'd like to point out is, um, and that's the mechanical room and, and what's labeled as the attic. It's eight foot uh, at the top. Um, I believe this likely constitutes a story under the building code, and as such, uh, this district is limited to two stories. And it's a little germane to the discussion earlier of the height of the overall height that. that What's being suggested is that that element be lowered to not constitute a story under the building code, still function as a mechanical room, and it would serve to lower the overall height of the building. Bob, if it were classed as presented as a two-story building, does it comply with the height limit? Does Oh, yeah, it does. But yes. as a three-story building, it just has a, it has a story problem. Story is issue, yeah. Um, nonetheless, thank you for pointing out that option or recommendation. So, 
Does every person here feel they have enough information to make recommendations to the council? Mm -hmm. Mr. Durham, would you care to begin? Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's an amazing addition to Yon film. And, and, and I, I think I think possibly even we might want to add a stone facade to Gates Estate to further enhance it in this area. <laughs> but that's my personal opinion. You're good. Um, but I also got to say that, it, it, you know, I, I'm wondering in town where Summerston fits in with Red, where it fits in with Piazza Chisera, which fits in to Hotel Luca, which fits into Masonry right next to it. That's the beauty of Yonville. We have something amazing like this coming in, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to further enhance what we have here as a community. So with that being said, I'm still, I walked, uh, I walked the property. Um, I stepped on your grass. I'm sorry to take a further, closer look um, at the property and behind it as well. And that height over there just is, is a little disconcerting um, in terms of what it would mean to the residents on Humboldt Street. And to some smaller extent, the one behind, but not so much as as the uh, resident who was talking. I, 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 I'm not an architect, so I can't just say, God, it's a great idea, just flip it, and I'm all for it. But if there could be, it, it just seems to me that the fact that a driveway on that side might work better than just covering someone in that height is amazing. So that's my main concern. But also in terms of, I'm confused about the story. It still meets the height, but I mean, I think it's great once again that they're putting everything inside and it's not outside as well. So whatever that con condition needs to be done to ensure that that could happen, I think that's an important element of this as well. Um, so I'm still confused as to what, what needs to change for that, but I, I think it's very important that, I think it's very positive that the all of those elements are on the third story as opposed to in the back parking lot. And if I'm not mistaken, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spots in this, or eight, I'm sorry. Eight. Eight. So two will be residents, probably another two to three will be staff, and everybody else to Vintage Inn and Bellagio's Chagrin will be parking in their parking lot. So I'm, I'm wondering about the amount of traffic actually that's going to be coming in and out of the property on a daily basis as compared to what's already there. So in terms of your concern for the traffic and the, and I'm reminded of the way ad hoc and red flows right now and they were able to correct that and alleviate that issue down there as well. So my only, my only, cons my main concern is just the height of the building on top of um, the neighbor. I think everything else is great. I share uh, Jeff's concerns about the height too, but I think that's something that can be worked out eventually and generally it's an upgrade to the parcel and I'm for it. Thank you. Mr. Winterberg. Oh, okay, I'll jump in. Um, a, uh, love the architectural design. Actually, thank you very much for the upgrade. That white piece that was sticking out the front was just a little too harsh for me. Um, so I'm glad you softened that a little bit. Um, I, I, I mean, I share the concern of our residents. Um, looking at a 20-foot wall that's going to be over, I mean, it's basically what we're talking about is adding a 20-foot wall. Um, next to somebody's property, and you guys have a huge struggle with this particular property. I'm looking forward to it being upgraded. Uh, I can't see supporting it being on that side, though looking at it architecturally, it tucks in nicely there. Um, and f if you flip it to the other side, what I would be concerned about is now you've got a 20-foot just flat wall facing north, which is a wide open area, so driving down Washington, you're just going to see this big white expanse on the side facing onto the, um, uh, what's that property called, Edward the James. TKRG, yeah, Edward James. So if it did get flipped on the side and you start, you put it on the south side, um, there's something, I think there'd be something that you'd have to do to that side. You'd have to do something architecturally 
you're the architectural genius, not me, but that side just looks, and it's tall, and that would just be painful over overlooking the other um, parking lot. The positive, it's a parking lot, um, so I don't think you're gonna have to worry about the residence uh, piece there, but that would be my concern. Um, uh, I'm gonna pick on another little thing, which is uh, five foot sidewalks. We're kind of trying to go, though I don't think we've required it yet in town, but we're trying to move towards five foot sidewalks since we're trying to increase the pedestrian traffic and make it easier flow. So I would support a five foot sidewalk versus a four foot sidewalk out front. Um, also, I encourage, I know we're just providing suggestions as you move forward with the town council. The other thing would be solicit the rest of those neighbors because um, talk to all of them. That's just my personal suggestion um, that there is an in-depth conversation with each one of them, similar to the woman who is here today, about what would be their preference. Um, you don't have to do everything, but at least engage in that process. And you might have already, I don't know. Um, parking plan. Since, uh, as Jeff just brought up, there's going to be this, and we have it with every property on Washington, basically, except for vintage estates, um, which everybody parks there, uh, is there is the reality of what we require for parking and then actually what ends up happening for parking. So my bet is the staff wouldn't park there because the managers would say, don't park here, we've only got X number of spaces. So then they, the staff would be the ones parking around town. And then what we do is we get town members who say, hey, they're over on Humboldt parking in front of this woman's house because that's right next door and that's where everybody parks right now anyway. You can see all the cyclists and everybody park right there because there's an empty lot. And that you really develop, and this is part of the business plan side of it, a parking plan for where those staff members, if they are going to park on public streets, which we have this struggle in Yontville, that it's very specific where they can or can or do park. Um, but that there's a parking plan as part of your business proposal here as well, because we just have a parking issue. Um, I did bring up that tree uh, problem with the back property line. Um, again, that comes to working with uh, your neighbors. We're a small town here. We try to be really neighborly. Uh, this is a fantastic addition. I struggle a little bit with the architecture. I'm also on the Yonfil Arts Committee, and we have it constantly that one person says is absolutely beautiful, another person says, well, it's not, I wish it were Roman columns, and another person says, I don't call that art. Um, so you're going to get that whatever goes in there. Um, I'm with Jeff again on the fact that we do have some diversity, and I more tend towards looking at the quality of the craftsmanship and the architecture versus what particular style it's in. So I appreciate that. Um, I think that covers my comments. Thank you, Rob. Mr. Anglin. So I'd like to talk about Colin Rowe. I, I do believe in contextualism. I think it's um, something that I learned, and I, I um, feel that it, it really does create better architecture. That being said, it doesn't have to be a Spanish style or a, um, a craftsman style or a Mediterranean style per se, but I think that the building itself should respond to the environment that it's in. And edges are important. The north edge is, is really important. It doesn't respond to its neighbors to the north. That, in my mind, has to, to, to be addressed. I still think you can flip this plan um, and, and potentially make it work. Um, I, I applaud you for you, you, your attempt at contemporary architecture. This is a serious uh, building. It's not a pastiche like Piazza Cuerca, which is down uh, at the Wells Fargo. Um, and so I applaud that. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a contemporary building. What I do say is that we, it has to be in the context of our town. Um, it, it is not, uh, it doesn't meet the guidelines of our design ordinance and in and, and terms of materials and things like that. Um, it's commercial building, so maybe, you know, that could be debated. Um, 
I, I think that there are a lot of materials in this building. I think the design sculpturally is, it, it works really well. Um, and it's a series of planes and shadows. Um, maybe the materials don't have to be what they are. It's, it's such a large contrast. That's my opinion. Um, but I, I, you are constrained to the, the two living units, and so you'll have to deal with that. I, there's some, some functional things like the trash enclosure that you're going to have to address. There, there's certainly more demand on trash than you have uh, dealt with, and that's going to have to be addressed. Um, you know, I think that from what I sense is the general consensus is that that um, people are feeling favorable towards a contemporary building. All I ask is that it be in a context, in a relationship with its neighbors. It doesn't have to be stucco and it doesn't have to be clabbered siding. But it is in relationship and I think some of that relationship is, is defined by shadows and, and how you treat the light that, that um, you're, you're really kind of controlling to your neighbors and I think uh, that needs to be addressed. And um, by flipping the plan, that could do it. Um, so my recommendation is to move the driveway, keep the driveway in the same position that it is, and um, make it work on the south side of that, that, that property. Um, there's, there's open space to the south where the parking garage there, or the parking lot there, um, and you're actually being in, in a context to the neighbors to the north by pulling your building back and, and reducing the shadow line. So those are my recommendations. Parking, you know, I think um, parking is driven by uh, code requirements. I think that there is an issue around that, but I don't think it's the applicant's kind of uh, responsibility to, to carry that load. So. And, and I'm sorry, I've, I had one more addition that I, I just didn't talk about the height. I, I'd have to follow uh, uh, Bob's suggestion on the fact that um, I imagine the problem is since it's eight feet, you would consider that a story. And so a third story just isn't acceptable in this environment. So if you reduce that to four feet, six feet, something like that, not only would it reduce the overall mass, then it wouldn't be considered a third story. I'll try to be brief because you're going to hear little that hasn't already been said. Um, there was a prior application for this project that ran into the same problem you're running into. It's a tight site with a requirement to provide residential uses. While we can't impose this as a requirement, nor should we be able to, perhaps you've already done so, I encourage you to talk to your neighbor to the south about exploring a shared driveway option. We did see sketches on a prior iteration that showed how that could be possible, and it took that 20-foot drive aisle down and made it about 10. Greatly helped with the site. Notwithstanding that, I'm going to touch very quickly on a few things. I don't object to the granting of an exemption to allow three stories when the third story is small in overall area and is really only, I think, one foot seven inches taller than uh, it would be to not be a story. And in this case, I think the benefit of concealing all the equipment in mechanical equipment is okay. Um, I will strongly, strongly urge the council to, as I've said before, and I believe they've started doing, any time a fence is built between residential and commercial property, it needs to be of CMU, concrete that's plastered or otherwise finished. On this particular project, I would support a fence of this kind that was up to eight feet tall with sign-in on affected neighbors. I think it would make a substantial difference difference if it were a little bit taller in this location. Mr. Winterberg in particular touched on three things. Great advice. If when you go before the council you have your neighbors saying, we think this is a good idea, your meeting will go a lot faster. Um, when the building gets moved, and I think it is going to get moved, articulating the then exposed north elevation I'm sure will be a good idea. Um, and I submit to you it would be a wise idea to come forward with an application that has an aggressive tree replanting program. The trees are going to get destroyed. The 12-inch tree that's on the property line, which means both you and your neighbor own it, neither of you can touch it without the other's permission, um, that tree is going to have a hard time. And the trees to the east, the small fruit trees are perhaps not as important. Um, come in showing how you're going to replant those trees to restore 
privacy and, and shade for your neighbors, and I'm sure you can do that in the guise of the project. Um, under no circumstances, well, I'll back up. I don't know what to make of the design, except I like it. I, I, I can't. I can't articulate it, I just think it's cool. And, and I wish I could say so more intelligently than that. Unlike my personal feelings about the residential neighborhood of Old Town Historic, where I think there should be a really consistent design theme, design theme uh, I'm okay with Yonville having a variety of stuff in the commercial area. So I do think it's neat. Um, with that said, under no circumstances can I endorse zero lot line at that height adjacent to residential property. It's grossly inappropriate, I highly doubt anyone would want to be the person living next to that. Um, I understand it's a tight site. The constraints were there. Um, it, it's grossly inappropriate to put 20 feet at a zero lot line next to somebody's house, in my view. <clears throat> so I wish you the best. Thanks very much. Good night. Sandra, all sensible enough that you can make us sound clever <laughs> again. Thank nice you. Sure. And always does. <laughs> hey Sandra, hey Sandra, won't they lose? There's two parking spots on the street. They're going to lose it by adding a sidewalk and a curb because there'll be no parking. No, we're going to re-add those back. I believe. In front. Mm -hmm. Graham has a tight. Okay. Graham has a fully um, reviewed the plans, but okay. we'll get his comments okay. before it goes to town council. So staff and board reports. I have an so you I have and an I need to arm wrestle, box, or something. I did. I did. No, I didn't remember you agreeing. I would remember if you agree with me. But you beat me up in the end, and I agreed. No, actually, almost, you can't. We're almost done. Yeah, we're almost yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And you don't, <laughs> you 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 don't want to anyway. <laughs> He's got this really like pleasant, kind facade. He's Thank actually you. quite cruel. Mm. What? <laughs> I'm taking a cheap Spacing shot at Jeff. For a it's okay. Um. So, staff and board reports, what do you have to say about anything? Nothing really. <laughs> Let's discuss it in January. Yes, Can Rob, I bring please. up one thing? Um, I'd like to propose the addition of fireplace to accessory structures, specifically. You know, I would like to comment that one thing that wasn't raised when they were identifying all the accessory structures was there is that exception that the council can deem other similar type structures as accessory structures. Mm -hmm. So it's not limited to just the ten terms that were called out. I think um, I think we knew that. Okay. Yeah. And I think we also quickly agreed that it's a structure. Right, you did. You know, we don't Our landscape element. You know, at best his argument was since it's not defined as a structure, it's a landscape element. Then I think it's I something threw him a bone by having those arguments in the staff and report, but I was very sympathetic toward this applicant and he got, I didn't he got hosed. Yeah. I didn't but, like not being able to recommend approval. But you know, his letter talks about as oh hey, I'm from out of town. Yeah. I called the city of Duluth planning and building department. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because that's where he's from, his letter. And the state of Georgia's Department of Consumer Affairs. It's all the same rules. Yeah. It, that's both. Well, what trumps the issue in this point and is he hired a licensed contractor. That, that person is the one well, held to knowing the standards and is the responsible party. If he doesn't know it, he hired someone to know those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that well, that's when I was asking structure. them the question, <laughs> and Four they months. actually said they had a discussion about that. And I know. I was trying to see yeah. if they, they thought they could. They backed away when you started to pin them down. They yeah. Did they, they think they could get away with it? Yeah. I, I wasn't sure. Well, yeah. I mean, oftentimes you get that kind of, and I think the directive I hope on. Is this on? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah public Hi. Yeah, it's on. Anyway. Pity the poor Person. person who doesn't know his parents who's watching this right now. <laughs> yeah. So let me let me just say this, and, and I, I, I do think that we need to do something to save these people from themselves. And um, we've had a number, we've had a number. You can't fix stupid. You, no, you can't I, fix I, No, I, no, I but we've had a number of people that say, that. I don't know. I don't, don't know. agree with that at all. No. We, we, have, we have the ordinances, we have the codes in place. I own a business four and a half hours away from here. I know exactly what I need to do 
I know the chamber. I know everybody there. It's my job. And it, but it is your job. That's the difference between this guy who has well, restaurants. As a property and you, owner, you're, you're held to know the requirements of the district yeah. that you live in or the city you live no, in. No, I mean, the, I have a hotel up there. Influence. He has a restaurant. It's the same diff. I mean, and even yeah, more so, he's held an, up under higher standards with his restaurant than I am to my hotel. And that's, that's what's confusing. I, I think everybody needs to come in with their eyes completely open. And it, we've already become a nanny state as it is. And to, it, to start saying, you know, I signed all those disclosures when we bought that house, all about the egg preserve, all about the equipment in the morning, all about the wind machines and everything like that. I, I just can't see adding another paper. If you plan on making any changes whatsoever, be sure to call Sandra. You know, no, it's that's a building just, department issue. Yeah, no. That, well, I am working on an article for the next newsletter with your uh -huh water bill that will raise some of these issues that, Good. hey, you need to come and talk to us. Hey, if you're building a structure, hey, fences should only be six feet. Um, try to get the word out there at least. I'm sure people get those and they throw away their insert, but that's our how we're going to try to get the message out there. Well, I, I think it's that's good. Well, they built, they built the fireplace and then the guy retained a few months later after he got exposed, got an engineer to try to retrofit some drawings. So they probably the letter right, from, just the letter spin from on the it. pest control company yeah. comes after you know. the code enforcement right. letter. Hasn't that so does the seen. invoice yeah. from the landscape contractor. Yeah. Yeah. How would you like the, um, the back side of that fireplace? It's not finished. I know. I didn't see that until today, but I took those photos, and I would have included that in the staff report. That's obviously the facade issue. Yeah. So that's it. January. Can I insist? I doubt I can. I wish I had the power. I would abuse it ruthlessly. But well, can I? Already? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Then this is one I don't have. Oh, okay. But you want it? I do. Can I insist that automatic conflicts be posted on the no. staff reports? Okay. You may not. Then uh, here's, then that's what your map. conflict map is for, and that identifies only the conflicts with regards to your residence. There is such a large category of other conflicts sure. that it could have the misperception that if it's not listed you don't have a conflict um, uh, we've and had you, the argument okay. before and unless okay. I can just say say I've lost Where you live now, Rob? Yeah, uh, I'll just make a request that I can so get one I, like Bob I don't is, know Bob is working on that okay I thought he was gonna have it prepared today okay. but because um, they say it I'm like I, I don't know it's 300 you know feet. And, you know I did want I to mention to you um, your interest in property as a tenant could rise to the level of needing to recuse yourself. So you should look to those different No, you need to have a lease on month to month. Okay. If you're okay. month to month, okay. you're not okay. considered invested in a lease. So if you have a year lease, yes. If you're month to month, no. Interesting. Interesting. I did check. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a very that's what he does in his spare time. It is. It is. I had to check. So, so I, I have, I have, I have another issue, and that is. Rob's uh, just the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all, I bought these years ago when I was doing some work in town here. So these are pretty old. And, and I, I noticed that the way that we do updates to the zoning ordinance and things like that is by the resolution that's passed by the city, the town council is sent out um, and then incorporated into these documents. But the, the last one I have is like 2008. Yeah. And so Same we, way. as being the design review board, should be given these updates every time that they come out so that we're current uh, with what you're, you're, you're yeah. doing. Yeah. And right now we're not. Am I the only one who was handed the recently created combination? No, I've yes, because you're the chair. No, I haven't. I have. It. I'm surprised you have the documents you have because I thought. Those were I have those too because I did yeah. the same thing. Maybe these guys. Quite no, frankly, I go online. It sounds like maybe it no, happened when it was that. you and me and these three Touché. haven't gotten them. <laughs> so do you guys? No, I, I, I yes, guess you do. No, I don't have the newest. I don't What's your date on that? Yeah, no, this is my giant book. I just like to have the most current stuff because we're published. dealing with the most current no, issues. So. Can you Publish, give us that stuff? Published 2009. Yeah, before you leave tonight. Do you have them? Yeah, you're right. Run in Thank and see you. if I can find something for you. So all four of us, except for you, I guess Sandra doesn't like you, got this very nice, <laughs> That's really nice. updated company. He has it. Here's it. Place in order. The last one I have is He's from Carl Carlson there. He has it at home. <clears throat> 2005 was the last amendment. 
Okay. What am I? Some. Then you're miserably out of date. We'll fix that. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Anyone else? I make a motion. Let's adjourn. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Don't we vote on it?